Hey everyone, I'm Travis Wright, and you're listening to I'm a Fan Of, your show for music, comedy, and more. As always, if you are a musician, a comedian, or just someone that does something interesting, please reach out to me on Instagram at Travis Can Listen. You can find me on Facebook at I'm a Fan Of, or you can reach out to me through the website at I'm a Fan Of Pod.com. And if you just enjoy the show, please follow me there as well so you can stay updated on all the new episodes and everything that's going on. Um, this episode, we are talking to a musical guest, another favorite of mine, Bometheus. Um, man, where to start with him? First of all, he is always writing. He's always putting something out. Literally, if you go look at his catalog, it's about an album a year now for several years. Um, since the last time I talked to him on the show, I think this is his second or third release since then. Um, just an awesome, awesome writer and worker. He's not just throwing out content for the sake of content either. Each album, there is a theme. There is an essence to this album. You can tell it's something he wanted to write. He wanted to get out. And I'm always excited when he has you know new material for me to listen to because I know there's going to be substance to it. Even if I don't love every single song, I know that there's a passion behind it that he wanted to write it. It's not just filler or he wouldn't put it on there. Um, this album, exactly the same. Um, you know, he, to give you a sense of his kind of humor, his wit, the way he writes about things, the album is extremely serious. There's a lot of very serious, you know, intimate topics going on on this album that I still don't even know the root of to, to all of them, to be honest. And he kind of stays purposely vague on some of them because you can tell it's very, very close to him. Um, that being said, I would like to talk about the title. The title of the album is called Awful, Pompous, and Artificial. To give you a sense of kind of his humor, his dark humor, his wit, his, his funny twist on things, um, if you go to his Instagram, he tells a story at one of the So Far Sounds acoustic shows that he does about the title, uh, Awful, Pompous, and Artificial, where apparently one of the monarchs, I guess we don't know exactly which one, um, there was a uh, cathedral, St. Paul's Cathedral was completed. And I'm not sure if the monarch asked someone else or someone else asked the monarch, but somebody asked somebody, what do you think of this you know, giant cathedral that we just built? And um, they said, oh yeah, it's awful, pompous, and artificial, which sounds like, ooh, fuck you and your building, right? But he explains that, no, 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 no. Uh, actually, in that time period, all of those words were compliments, um, so just an insight to kind of his twist, you know, that that person was actually saying, oh, no, 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 this cathedral's amazing. It's awful. It's awesome. It's pompous. You know, it's grand. It's artificial, which is somehow a compliment back in that day. And we talk about it in the interview. He explains it better than I just did. But that's part of the reason I like this guy. There's always a dark sense of humor with his music, but it never takes away from the serious nature of the writing. So with that being said, uh, please go watch the music review where we actually sample a few of my favorite songs. That's up there as well. Um, and please go listen to the album for now. We're going to roll right into the interview with Bometheus. Enjoy. The I'm a Fan of Podcast. Music, comedy, and more. Bometheus. Yeah. <laughs> A.K.A. Jonathan. A.K.A. Bometheus. Yeah. Dude, it's so good to see you, man. I told you, you when too. you came in, I was like, I don't even want to talk. I just want to get I, on the mic. Yeah, let's not. Um, and we were trying to figure out how long it's been. How long have you guys lived in Chicago now? Well, it's like the uh, start of our second year. Oh, so it's been over two years since I've seen yeah, you then, right? Yeah, I think that's about no right. No way. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. So that would have been early in the pandemic, I guess, when you came in here for Michael yeah. Pazwar's show. Yeah, that's true. Wow. Dude, time does go by so quick. So, yeah, you were asking about my kid. He's going to be three in February. Okay. So I did nice. have a kid last time I saw you, but he was brand, that's brand right. new. That's right, yeah. yeah. I think, and uh, back then, you didn't show your face on social media. No. And then recently, I saw <laughs> I saw your face yeah. on social media. I was like, what's going on Well, here? you know, I was, I was worried about crossover into some of my personal life and affecting, like, career the the career that i have because this isn't paying the bills yet you know yeah um and then i just realized like that's probably really not going to be a big issue yeah you know and then video content is king so it's like why not why not share it yeah. right <laughs> this beautiful face yeah no. <laughs> come on man um how has the move to chicago been because i know you guys went because your wife's going to school up there right yeah yeah, yeah and so i know you were a little nervous about it but now y'all have been there for a minute i was pretty yeah. nervous about it like i was that i was pretty scared yeah um and then we got there and it was just awesome mm -hmm. and it just kept getting awesome and when we moved there people uh you know i'd fly, i started playing shows almost immediately and people would come and be like so you guys just moved and we were like <laughs> yeah and they'd always talk to me like like uh they were the old like patients in the in the psych ward mm. you know and you're the new guy and he's like dr bill seems cool it gives me gives me my, my pills <laughs> and all that 
And I'm like, oh, just wait. Dr. Bill is going to put you in a straitjacket later, throw you outside, <laughs> let you freeze your ass off, and yeah. and just leave you there, you know? And uh, so everyone was just convinced that we were going to hate it. Mm. And it, and when you say everyone, you mean everyone when you moved there? Yeah. Thought you were going to yeah, hate yeah. it? Yeah, oh, yeah. Like wow. local Chicago people would come up to me and be like, so you like this? And I was like, yeah, we love this. And <laughs> Did y'all like, show up in the winter or the summer? Uh, we showed up in August. Okay, so yeah, it was nice weather. It was, it was really great. Beautiful. It was yeah. gorgeous. And yeah, that was the thing. Is they were like, don't get too comfortable, okay? Yeah, yeah. And I, you, it looks like you can like this, but you're not one of us kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, I mean, we, we were given good advice, like in, invest in a good coat. Because if you don't have a good coat, you are going to be miserable. If you have a good coat, you're fine. And I have a physique that um, does better the more layers you put on it. Yeah. You know? You like, don't trap heat well. Sweater <laughs> weather is is my friend, you know? Yeah. yeah. And uh, the more layers you put on, the better it is. And and we love it. Yeah. We absolutely love it. My wife loves Chicago, and we're trying to find plenty of excuses to get up there. Well, dude, come yeah, on up and, and see us. I, I think, uh, you know, I started running. And um, <laughs> oh, listen, listeners, it's only been uh, like two and a half, three minutes before I brought up running, yeah. <laughs> if anybody's keeping track. But, uh, y- you know, they do the Chicago Marathon. Yeah. And so I told my wife, I was like, I want to keep running these. So let's try to find spots where I can like run. And then we spend like a week there. Afterwards, yeah. You know. Yeah. And uh, Boy, Chicago's Chicago would be great. Yeah. yeah we'd love to see you up yeah. there. Um, you you were talking about, you know, people were worried you guys weren't going to like it. Yeah. Can I say from my vantage point, just watching your stuff on social media, and then just remembering you before you left. Yeah. Like, you were never unsure of what you wanted to do with your music. Like, you were never unsure of yourself. You're always pretty confident of how you uh, are. Oh, that's good to hear. But you could definitely see there, like you said, the nervousness of kind of everything, I guess. Yeah. Uh, like, not not even just Chicago. Just, I guess, maybe life in general. Like, yeah. you guys weren't married yet. It you, was scary, man. And now on your social media, especially with the album, it seems like there's just this happiness and this <laughs> silliness about you that wasn't there before. Not that you were sad or anything, but yeah. it's like you post all these clips with... Because uh, here you were playing pretty much solo most of your shows, A right? lot, yeah. Most of the time, just you. A lot of me, yeah. And now the majority of the clips I see, you have other musicians with you, yeah. which is what you talked about wanting. You're like, I wish I had a band. I know, I, wish I, I know. And I, I was like, oh, hell yeah, he's getting this now, <laughs> you know? And uh, it really it really seems like there's a lot of joy that came from putting this most recent album together because you had band members to play with now. Absolutely, you man. You know, like what yeah. was... What was the stupid little toy y'all were playing on your Instagram? Oh, bum, that's bum, a... Bum, bum, yeah, bum, it's bum, a, bum. the automaton. <laughs> yeah. crazy little silly nonsense electronic keyboard-esque. It's, it looks like a keyboard saxophone. Yeah, right? it's like a logarithmic um, touch screen yeah. sort of thing. And it's pressure sensitive. And you just kind of... <laughs> you can switch like the... Uh, the the interval of like the uh, how low it is yeah yeah like the octaves that. and everything yeah and you can yeah. go in between there and then you're just kind of set with whatever it has yeah yeah and yeah that was <laughs> Cynthia's brother Garrett um, well, he's I mean, also an artist now he's but that's a perfect out. example of the silliness that you're having up there yeah do you know what I mean yeah. where it's like you're writing this serious music this moody music but there's this playfulness behind all of it. Yeah, and I think it yeah. really comes through. You know? Well, I'm glad to, yeah. s- to hear that. Yeah, Do you feel that way? I think I've I've always tried to maintain it mm-hmm. in some in some sense, and like even um, my live shows, um, I had <laughs> I played one show south side of Chicago, and uh, we were the only white people. Um, that played. Yeah, but that you're used to that from your oh, Atlanta I have, days, I right? I used to it. It was aw- I was so excited. For those who don't know, he grew up in Atlanta, and uh, you. What was the instrument? Was it just singing, or were you? Well, I played play violin. That's right. You yeah. were playing violin at the church, all, all, all black, black church. church. For a minute, yeah. That's right. Yeah. But um, yeah, I, <laughs> oh, so we were the only white people, and uh, it was me and my buddy Taylor on guitar, and we we did a. I mean, it went great. Yeah. But I always play. I mean, my songs are dramatic, and they're a lot to deal with. And then I try to incorporate something like stand up. There's mm. there's. There's storytelling, and then they're just jokes of different varieties mm-hmm. kind of throughout. And sometimes it's improvised, and sometimes it's stuff I've written, you know. But I'm, I'm glad to hear what you just said. My music is, what did you say, moody and dramatic or dramatic and something? I can't remember what you I said. I can't remember what I just but said. But anyway, either. I'm glad you said it that way because every time I show my wife your music, She's like, I think you really love him because he plays guitar really well. And I'm like, no, no, no. It's like, you're only listening to the music whenever you're like washing the dishes and doing something. Can you just sit down and listen for a moment? <laughs> and she's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll listen. I'll listen. Give me time. Give me time. But you know, it's like, it's, 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 it's kind of heavy. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And uh, yeah. So at the end, but 
it was it was one of the the audience engagement at this show was just incredible mm. because you know and one of the jokes I made at some point it was like every time I told a joke the laughter would get so out of control we couldn't even start the song <laughs> and it was like the most insane yeah. awesome thing and finally I looked at them and I was like y'all we played a show in Evanston and Evanston's like way far north mm-hmm. super Whiteville and and I was like. And they did not know how to laugh at anything. And everybody <laughs> just died even more. At the end of the show, this this older woman, I think she was probably in her 60s or 70s, she grabbed me. She said, young man, I want you to call Netflix and get a special. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, do you have and their I was number? Like, Can you call Netflix and demand a special yeah. on my behalf? Because I think that yeah. would actually go a lot further. After watching your... your um duet of pseudo anonymity yeah. that you put up. First yeah. of all, where did you film that? Yeah, we filmed it in a church uh called um uh Atonement Episcopal. Yeah. Uh yeah, and it's on the north side of Chicago. It was the absolute perfect setting for yeah. that type of performance. It's, it's a really historic building, mm-hmm. beautiful space, and they were really sweet. Like we mm-hmm. came in and uh my wife and I had attended there a few times and we met with the the interim priest and um I at some point I was like, hey, it's totally cool if it's not a thing, but we're trying to find a space to do this and we were going to do it in my living room. But I really love this. And if it's possible, we'd love to use it. And he was like, yeah, just tell me when and you guys can have it. Hmm. They didn't ask to, like, listen to what we were going to do first. They didn't charge us for anything. Like They just use the space. Yeah. And it's the perfect room. You know, rooms are so key Mm -hmm. for environments and songs. Right. Yeah. And a lot of people struggle with that. They think, oh, we'll just play in here. And it's even if you get a room to play in, do whatever you can on a budget, lighting, whatever you can, just to kind of treat it a little bit. Yeah. Because just the natural reverb in that room and the natural kind of all churches have kind of weird. Yeah. Ambiance, everything's different. Yeah. But it works perfectly, right? Yeah. Uh, how many takes does it? Does yeah. it? Because first of all, you two are both accomplished guitarists. Yeah. It's clear on the video, like <laughs> these are very difficult arrangements you're playing yeah and the song's only what seven minutes it's about yeah six and a half minutes <laughs> seven minute, uh, six yeah. and a half minutes so it uh it bothers me knowing that you're gonna tell me it only takes you like two or three takes to get that when you guys play it yeah that was the the fourth complete take mm-hmm. um it was the fifth take overall the the third second take got uh ruined mm. which was a real bummer because um it was flowing so beautifully mm-hmm. and i I really think there's a timeline where nothing happened with the recording part of it, and that second take was the one that, that yeah. we got, you know. That's the reason people need to go to live shows. Yeah. Because there's always a little piece of magic that you never know if you're going to catch on a recording or not. Yeah. And it's so hard. It's so hard to capture anything like that right. when you're setting out to do it. Of, of course. Right? Yeah. No. That, so you guys could probably sit down in your living room oh, we could and have done knock it. that out Just no fine. problem. But that, I, mm-hmm. I, I mean, I looked at Sam, my, my friend Sam Amati, who we, we co-wrote that piece together, mm-hmm. um, and I was like, the thing is, dude, we cannot walk into this looking for perfection. Mm-hmm. We can't do that because we're, we're already stacking the deck against ourselves with everything because... Um, not only are we trying to play an impossibly difficult piece together, we want it to be filmed from lots of different angles, and we want the audio to be recorded. I think there were like seven, between seven and ten microphones in, mm-hmm. in the space, you know. And um, when you're in the space, suddenly it's a big deal because it's like we only have this much time yeah. to get it, and uh, all that pressure is. And when just you start mounting. doing the math of you know, twenty five minutes is only going to be about three takes, if even. Yeah, yeah. You know, so now it's like, whew, we only have yeah. a handful of opportunities. And on the fifth take, it was like I looked at him and was like, if we don't get it on this one, we're not going to get it. Mm-hmm. What we actually do not have time. Mm. And I was like, I want you. Uh, I think I literally did say it to him. I was like, I'm I'm playing angry right now. <laughs> I need you to play angry. Yeah. And he was like, Well, man, I don't want to. You know, I don't want to fuck it up with like being angry. You know, I, I need to like be in the, like no, be angry because if you're angry. You're engaged in the war, the battle that is performance, which is, am I concentrating? Mm-hmm. And everything is vying for your attention. And if you can keep your concentration, even if you fuck up, I don't care about that. But if you can keep your concentration all the way to the end, that that's a good performance. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. yeah, and you have to, at that point, you have to embrace that however you recorded on the album yeah. is going to be We're that not, version of perfection. That. Yeah. yeah. And every live performance is now going to be 
ooh, can they do it? You know, <laughs> can they get through it in, 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 yeah. a, in a fun way? Sure, there is. But it's also like um, I always remind everybody when, whenever because we just did the release show mm-hmm. last week weekend. Um, and I looked at everybody beforehand. I was like, look, guys, you played on the re- almost everybody that played played on the record. That's which so cool. was the most amazing yeah. part about it. But I looked at them and I was like, look, you guys, we wrote your parts. Some, some of you wrote your own parts. That's fine. Um, what we're about to go do, forget it. It doesn't matter. <laughs> when we go out on stage, do what you feel led to do in that yeah. moment. I trust all of you. Mm-hmm. The, the reason that you're on the record is because I trust you, both as my friend and musically. Like You are allowed to do whatever you want out there. And I'll stand right there beside you. I don't care. And that's got to take so much pressure off, too. I hope it does. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons I say it's like. Or it's worse. They take it as like, oh, I don't want to upset dad. No. I don't want to. <laughs> I don't want to disappoint him. Uh, he gave me no, the whole. They, I'm proud of you no matter could, what. Yeah. But is he, is he really proud of me? <laughs> I yeah. really was. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. It, it uh, now that you say you were kind of you guys were kind of angry it does there is an intensity to that recording the specifically the youtube recording is what we're talking yeah, about yeah yeah the live yeah. and um there's a lot of fun man i you know i play guitar as well so but you can see that frustration literally in the strumming yeah you know what i mean yeah. <laughs> on the faster no, parts where yeah. you're like Whoo, we really got to get it <laughs> and i could just imagine myself you know out of the five takes each take at one point in a different part of the song, I would just drop my pick in the guitar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, God damn it. Again? And then you got to do the awkward shake yeah. it upside down. <laughs> Hold on. Hold are, on. Are we still rolling? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it's just so. It's, well, there is that thing where like once you're in the space, it's like, man, at home I could play this no problem. Mm-hmm. And then I'm here and it's like, I can't remember how to hold my guitar, mm-hmm. you know? And um, on, it's fun to do something like that with a different instrument because um, Pseudo Enemy is a very serious piece for both of us. And the way that it was composed and put together is the mo- almost the most classical of, mm-hmm. of anything that like neoclassical of anything on that record or really on most of my records mm-hmm. because we actually put it together. You know, like we stand behind every single note that's mm-hmm. in that thing. And we've actually now had it transcribed. So if you buy the record on Bandcamp, you get the whole score oh, and the part. So awesome. if you want to learn it, you can. Kind of like. how, do, how do you approach writing something like that? Because the only thing I have for reference for that type of arranging, mm-hmm. um, like a couple years ago, I think I sent you that punk rock band No Effects who did like an 18-minute long song. Yeah. But even then, it really felt like you're piecing together different songs and just kind of making... That's how that that album sure, was, right? Sure. Whereas this one really, it feels like it flows. Like you couldn't just chop out a section without it still sounding like that song. Yeah. So uh, how do you approach writing something like that? Did you two just say, "Hey, we want something that's almost seven minutes that's just two guitars," <laughs> or did you each have a couple pieces together and just build off of it? Yeah. Um, so it it is the theme of the piece is one of the oldest things I I've ever composed. Like it's one of the first things I composed. Mm-hmm. I was like fourteen or fifteen when I wrote it. And um it was just that bum 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 bam bit it 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 and um I messed with that for a long time and kind of had this like weird improvisational arrangement of it. And it was just for me, it was just something that I made. And then um I met Sam in high school a couple of years after I'd put it together sort of and uh we started hanging out and he was an incredible guitarist you know that was all he did i was a violinist who had dreams of being a guitarist and he was just a guitarist he had pedals and he and he like knew hendrix songs for shante licks and like mm. he just he's just awesome you know and, and we get together and it was like i got to pretend like we were in a band or something <laughs> and um so i showed him that one day and he and i worked out like his duet part for just the theme and if you go to the youtube uh video we've chopped it up so you literally can see where the theme is so you can know what i'm talking about but um so we put that together and then we kind of made it our own like seven minute mess but we we were like sophomores juniors in high school we had no taste mm-hmm. we had no restraint we had no sense of any of these things we were just showing <laughs> off and being silly and um, yeah. how hard can we make this yeah. how difficult can we make and it, this it was just a yeah. mess it was just ridiculous but there were parts of it that were really really good mm-hmm. and um we kind of like laughed about it and then didn't really touch it for years and didn't really even really see each other for a long time in fact when we recorded um that video i think that was the first time we'd seen each other in person in like 6 or 7 years wow uh, cuz he lives in vancouver canada now and uh we met in austin so you know high school and all that and um 
So about a year ago, around the time that I moved to Chicago, actually exactly when I moved to Chicago, I reached out to him and we just started talking more every day. And it was really nice. And like our friendship was kind of rekindled and it had never died. But, you know, it was like, oh, we kind of talk every day, Mm -hmm. you know. And at some point I was like, you know, I've thought about that piece, pseudonymity, quite a bit recently. And I'd really like to bring it back and put it together with you. And I think at certain points, like there had been talks of collaborating with other artists here in Dallas where I'd kind of shown it to them and shown them like Sam's part a little bit. And they were like, dude, I can't, I don't know what that is. And I was like, yeah, I I can only do that with Sam. But it didn't really feel possible because Sam's so far away, you know? I was like, I guess we just never get to do this. But they were talking. And I was like, well, maybe we can do this. And so basically in that same conversation, he was like, absolutely, I'd love to do that. That sounds awesome. And so we just started writing stuff immediately and it was kind of insane like um we did everything through like voice memos and facebook messenger Mm -hmm. and the the video chat function of facebook Mm -hmm. messenger and uh every i i mean i think we spent a month or a month and a half solid just writing our parts and every day we would just get on and be like hey i have these three new measures you know what do you think about this and like okay yeah and then we'd mess around with it and then um eventually we just recorded single takes all the way through, playing the whole thing. So Sam, I think Sam laid his down first, mm-hmm. and then I recorded an entire take just so we could get an idea of what it actually sounded like because we didn't really know what it sounded like together. We just had like a general happy idea that maybe it worked, and then it was like, wait, I think this like really worked. There are a few things we need to fix, but I think this could be awesome, you mm-hmm. know. And we sent it to a bunch of people and got a bunch of feedback on things, and then we changed some stuff here and there. And ultimately, we set out to just make a duet for two guitars that would stand on its own, and I wanted it to be um, the equivalent of acoustic metal is what I Mm -hmm. wanted to make. And my Uncle Dave is like a big metalhead, and he he writes reviews for a massive metal blog, Mm -hmm. and like that's like his big... He knows all of it. That's what he knows. And I was like, hey, man... um, so I don't know if this is a thing, but I think we've completed a piece that is acoustic metal. And he was like, that's not a thing. <laughs> and I was like, no, 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 I know it's not a thing, but I think we did it. And he was like, no, that's not real. And I was like, okay, well, what would you call like unplugged uh, m- metal? And he was like, that's just surf rock. And I was like, okay, well, what we made is not surf rock, <laughs> and it is metal. Like, there are some riffs in there that are super heavy, yeah. but they're acoustic guitars playing them. Mm-hmm. If we put a distortion pedal on it, you'd just be like, yeah, fuck it. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. But it's not that. We wanted to maintain a sense of intimacy while, you know, r- rocking out. Mm-hmm. Because there's something about, um, I mean, a lot of the, the album is about um, isolation and uh, alienation and things like this. And that piece, even when I was writing it, it was about isolation. It's about being alone. It's about wanting to be able to to say and describe things that you do not have the freedom to say or describe. You do not have the freedom to feel this, you know? Mm -hmm. And so you put the mute on your violin and you feel it that way. So no one around you knows, you know? Mm -hmm. Or you you play it on an acoustic guitar. Yeah. Because if you put the metal if you put the distortion pedal on, you know, you're gonna cause a a ruckus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What um you said you started this piece when you were 14. Yeah. Do you remember what you were listening to at the time that was your favorite that might have inspired that? Um, well, I was just listening to almost exclusively um, Jimi Hendrix and SRV. Okay. So it's not really totally different. The yeah. same. Mm-hmm. So it is. It is interesting. And and in those days, I was like teaching myself the guitar and almost exclusively playing blues. Mm-hmm. That's like the easiest way to learn how to play the guitar is yeah. to play the blues. I'm glad to hear you mention the metal aspect of it. Because I was I was very hesitant to say some of my thoughts on it because you never know if someone's going to find Metallica insulting or not. No, but Metallica, a lot of their older records, yeah. they would do those only musical pieces. Yeah, and so when I when I was hearing some of the heavier parts, that's immediately what it took me back to. Nice was how these guys who were you know. I mean, at the time, I guess they were pretty edgy. I didn't live through their beginnings. You sure. know, I came afterwards. Right. But if you ask me, albums like Master of Puppets and Justice for All, those are very those heavy, edgy, stuff. heavy yeah. albums, right. even for their time, I think. Right. And uh, so for guys like that to then go, no, no, no we're going to do something without lyrics. Right. That, you know, that's not a popular choice. No. Um, and then you would catch yourself in the car listening to those instrumentals. You wouldn't skip over them. Yeah. And, you'd be and like, so, yeah, this, yeah, it immediately brought awesome. me back to that kind of thing. I was like, wow, that's very interesting. But I love the... 
I love the choice to stay acoustic with it because I've always felt there when, when it's played a certain way, an acoustic guitar has a power to it that you can't get from an electric guitar. Yeah. Something about that chug, yeah. you know, of that type of string through just, just a, a just wooden what's hole. there. Yeah. Yeah. And if you're doing it well, you know, you, you talked about Stevie Ray Vaughan. Have you ever seen, there's an incredible. Him playing 12 string. Yes. That acoustic <laughs> clip yeah, of him dude. playing 12 oh string. Oh my God. And you're just like, God, the fierceness he plays that with. It's incredible. While also looking effortless. Yeah. Where you know he, you know what I mean as a guitar player. Like yeah. you have that grip strength with right. your fret hand. Right. And anybody who's ever tried to play a 12 string when you don't play it all the time, you're like, oh, hold on. I got a learning curve here real yeah. quick. Let me, let me remember yeah. how to press your strings again. Are destroyed. Yeah. And, yeah. and yeah. then pretty soon you get it down. But him, it looks like he can pick up anything he wants. Well, dude, that guy was dominate. playing. His, even on his electric guitar, he was playing with like, what it was like super heavy gauge or 14s right? or like yeah. piano strings or something insane and he's bending yeah. the shit out of them but it's it gets you so it gets me riled up when i see a guy like stevie ray vaughn go let me also rip it up on this acoustic guitar <laughs> and you realize he's not a one-trick pony no, he can just he can play, play the guitar man that, that is play. so much fun yeah yeah so i i loved because i saw the video obviously before you released the record right yeah, yeah. and i was like oh shit this guy's putting out something like that's so much fun because you know, it's not a smart marketing move to write a <laughs> seven, six and a half. Yeah, seven. But that's that's never been your thing of like, what's the hit yeah. going to be? <laughs> Will they put this on the radio? <laughs> yeah, so the record's out now. And yeah. uh, I was lamenting the fact that I was like, man, the, the first track is getting played more than any of the other songs. And uh, Cynthia's well, when, do you mean the first track or the first song? The first, like the first track, Bar- Baron Fields. Uh, or no, f- wasted words. Okay, okay, yeah. yeah. So the true first track. Yeah, mm-hmm. which is, you know, it's a very, um, to me, these these kinds of um, instrument uh, instrumental or vocalization type tracks are meant to like be a microcosm of what the album is about to be. Yeah, you're it's setting like an the overture, mood. right? So, Here's guys yeah. we're about to experience. This is what's this. happening. Mm-hmm. And uh my my wife's brother Garrett was like, "Well, yeah, it's probably like people put it on and they're like, "Oh, this is going to demand a lot from me. I don't <laughs> think I can." <laughs> oh, it's a commitment. Yeah. <laughs> oh. I mean, it's, it's, I'm just looking for more of a fling, yeah, like a yeah. one-night stand song. What do you have? Yeah, <laughs> you said you want me to meet your parents. Yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah, your 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 music's definitely not like the light up necklace and Jello shot. It, no, you know? um, no, but again, that's what I like about your style. That's what I've always liked. Is especially the more I get to know you, I know that you're silly and you're not ridiculously arrogant or pompous and like. <laughs> Let me show you how much of a musical genius I can be, right? So when I listen to it, I know it's not coming from that angle, but I do wonder what people who don't know you think about it because especially in a digital age where people are streaming and it's like, I'll give them 15 seconds to prove that he's worth my time. Right. And this album will never be that. No. You know? Yeah. But for the... I did try to do more of that. I think you've done more of that than you have in the past. Yeah. Uh, And I'll I'll get to that in a minute. But uh, I do think there's a large group of people who love music enough that when they do find it that way you know they'll they'll uh they'll get it in a medium that they can experience it like that Mm -hmm. you know and then they'll go yeah i get it right i get it because i definitely i felt listening to this record this time the compared to your previous records i do feel like you're really finding your balance finally Mm. of what you your mix of the popular music you like Mm -hmm. with your classical background yeah and uh, because it, it felt um, felt like you had a very cohesive theme, mm-hmm. but it was still all over the place enough to be interesting. Because <laughs> at times I was thinking, OK, here's here's more of his traditional background. And then at times I was thinking, oh, I remember him telling me he was really into Muse. I'm hearing a little bit of this here. And I was like, wow, this feels a little bit like Radiohead now. But it, it never <laughs> felt specifically like any of those things. Nice. Yeah. Um, so, you know, and I think I was texting you about. Specifically, your vocals, man. I yeah. feel like you've realized not how you can sing, but how you would like to sing. Yeah. No, I thought of that. But also, I had surgery. Yeah. You know, um, and I learned a lot of things. What was the surgery again? Remind me. I had a polyp on my vocal cords. That's right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, and then I was silent for two weeks, which was an, uh, a strange, it was a blessing, but it was weird. Mm-hmm. Um 
And then, um, yeah, recovery took a, f- a couple weeks, I think maybe a month and a half or so of going to therapy and, and figuring out just how to speak again, not mm-hmm. even just how to sing, just how to talk, you know? Um, What's that sensation like when you're done with the two week rest? And it's, it's really time to scary. Use your voice again. It's but really. T- what's the physical feeling like? Is it like a sore throat or? No, it's just weird. Hmm. Like it feels like they're like cobwebs or something, you know. And mm-hmm. it starts moving. I mean, I remember um, the voice therapy. The first voice therapy session was online. Actually, they were all online. And yeah, because like, this was during COVID, right? Well, yeah, but I mean, we're twenty twenty one. Like, okay, it. it it, it felt like we could have been in person. Mm-hmm. And I was like, man, this is actually really scary. Like, what if I fuck something up again, you know, and you're not mm-hmm. there to, you know, but it wasn't like that. I think they, um, cause they were also like, do not make a single noise for two weeks. Do not do anything. Do not, you know? <laughs> and I don't think that's actually true. Like, I don't mm-hmm. think you actually can't make noise. I think what it is, is they like try to terrify you. Right. So you don't, accidentally do something right but you probably would be okay yeah but you're sitting there clearing your throat like <clears throat> yeah no yeah actually <laughs> oh god really yeah. yeah yeah and um and then i just learned a lot of things like um you know clearing your throat especially the way that i have most of my life is one of the worst things you can do for your vocal cords oh wow like really aggressively clearing your throat awful hmm. it, it's a terrible thing to well, do how are you supposed to clear your throat yeah um you can clear it gently um in the way that you're thinking like <clears throat> like that's okay as long as it's not super frequent or violent and then um the other way is uh to to, in, to take in a lot of breath and then just release like a very tight compact stream of continuous air mm-hmm. and what it does is it allows your vocal cords to relax and then like whatever's on there just kind of falls off <laughs> and it's a weird sensation. That sounds and it's strange. It sounds like it shouldn't work. Yeah, but it's yeah. that that is a much healthier way to do yeah. it. Or um, like lip trilling. Mm-hmm. What lip trilling does is it forces you to use the healthy amount of air that you normally would need to speak in a healthy manner. Mm. And a lot of people do not breathe properly when they when they talk. And I wasn't breathing properly when I just spoke, much less when I sang. So um, you just end up like forcing your vocal cords to do too much without Mm. the air supply that would allow it to just be free and good. It sounds like you had a very good, uh, I guess that's a physical therapist. Uh, I don't know what they call it. Speech speech pathologist maybe? maybe Something like that. Yeah, Yeah, that's interesting. So how long did it take after that two-week rest to feel... 100% 100% I'm ready to sing. <laughs> well, so right before we moved, at the end of July, I think it was on July 28th, um, I got an email from SoFar. SoFar was coming back again now in Dallas, and they were like, we want you to play this show. And I was like, oh, man, my doctor told me I needed to wait another week, but I think I'm going to play this show. <laughs> <laughs> so I did. And I this was it. how far out? Uh, let's see. I think I had my surgery in June, mm-hmm. like 15th of June, and this was the 20th of July. So not that far not out. Not that far. Oh, out. wow. Yeah, we were taking some risk. But, um, yeah, I, but I also thought it was like a good opportunity to try out some stuff. Mm-hmm. And so far, sets are always much shorter. So it didn't feel like I was signing up to do something that actually could be potentially dangerous. Mm-hmm. Like if I had played only 15 minutes. They wouldn't have cared. Wouldn't and you have fun. enough in your catalog, too. You can, oh, yeah. you can play stuff that's not going to push the limits of your vocals. Yeah. Yeah. You have a large enough large enough selection. And that was a nice thing on this record was that a lot of these songs I wrote after I found out about the polyp before the surgery. Mm-hmm. And so in order to sing them, I just had to be in my lower register a lot. Mm-hmm. Like Raining in the South again. That's one of the ones I was going to talk to you about. That's I, a yeah. song where like, I really don't sing high on that at all. Mm-hmm. And when it did come time to, to record, I was like, this is kind of nice. Like I'm not... Like, yeah, just... there's a lot of very mellow... Is it Raining in the South that I'm thinking of? Sorry, I'm horrible with track names, so I'm going to... That, that's fine. I'm always going to look it up, but... Yeah, it felt like... Raining in the South is very... It's long and mellow. Mm-hmm. And it, I, I had somebody describe it as like a Randy Newman and Jack Johnson wrote a song together kind of thing. Yeah, that's the one I'm thinking of. <laughs> yeah, where it starts with a funny trumpet and a yeah. giggle. And, and then, uh, yeah, because I love the 
I always love the choice for brushes on drums. Yeah. When people go that route and they do it well. I feel like there oh. is no there there is no sound that exists that is more soothing to the soul no. than a than a brushed snare. It's, I didn't get it until I found a uh, one of the bands I was playing in that I, I was just a guitarist in that band. Mm. I didn't really write much. Um, we had this incredible drummer who was professionally trained with like kind of a jazz background. Like nice. he I believe he went to school for, for drumming. For dr- yeah. yeah. And uh, we had a song like that where the guitar parts were actually pretty fast. It was, or not fast, but it was a lot of strumming. You know, the song was mellow, but the strumming was fast, you know. And he's like, guys, I got this idea, you know. And we were thinking, hmm, because we were kind of like an indie rock band at that point. Sure. And he just did it so well. I was like, Mm. oh, so these brushes, they actually do things when you know what you're doing. Yeah. And And it's such a good vibe with it. It's such a wonderful space Mm -hmm. where you can, now it's like, oh, now it's almost like putting, like, like when Bob Ross, like, we're just going to put a little white on the canvas. Yeah. And now you can paint on it, you know? Just a little platinum white, man. Well, let me. While we're kind of talking about those choices, because in the past you were very DIY, literally recording songs on a cell phone, yeah, on, yeah, yeah. on GarageBand at home, uh-huh. right, in your closet. Yeah. And now you've definitely, with each record, grown more polished. But this one, I would say, is probably the most polished recording you've done, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And with the most production and the most variety of performers that are not you. Yeah. So how, did, how were you able to approach this record knowing other people are performing on it? Were you still, were you still wanting to control a lot? Were you able to let it go? <laughs> what was your method for it? Because that was a very new experience for you, right? Yeah, I mean, so I think I've been building up to it, but mm-hmm. it, this is the most people for sure. Um, and I think Season of Limbo, the last record, which I think is the one that you and I talked about the last time I was on here. Um, I think that's true. I think the last time you were on here on my podcast you were on michael pasvar's podcast that's true um but no i think it was before that it, we we did inadequate i think you're right yeah I, that's way back okay yeah, yeah yeah and you know you put out something like every six months so. yeah <laughs> uh yeah i think yeah. you're right was it okay well on seasons of limbo it I, was inadequate because that's the one with your uncle and yeah yeah yeah, yep, yeah. that's mm-hmm. right yeah. yeah yeah because i had kind of Learned your stuff through Sweet Nothings. Okay, wow. And then Inadequate yeah. was coming out. That's right. I think you might have actually come on the show before Inadequate was out. That's and right. Talked about Sweet Nothings. That's right. Because mm-hmm. I sent yeah. Inadequate to you. And was like, if you want to talk about this, you're like, this that's is right. Weird. I don't want to talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I think all I did was feature some of the stuff because I think you were gone mm-hmm. out, uh, up to Chicago by then. And so um, I think we featured some songs on an episode that somebody else was interviewed on. Yeah. From Inadequate. Yeah, that yeah. was nice. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, uh yeah wow uh well i have been building up to it so mm-hmm. on inadequate i worked with a bunch of people again which was nice and then on seasons of limbo i worked with even more people um and then on this one it was just i really just kind of went for it mm-hmm. um and it was also one of the first times i was able to pay my performers per, like what they wanted mm-hmm. you know in the past i mean a lot of it was just like Hey, do you think you could just do this? Because I have nothing. If you're you know? free on Tuesday, yeah. for three hours, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, and they're all. I mean, they're all my friends, mm-hmm. and so it was. It was never something weird, you know. Um, like I'd never go find some like random person who's a professional and be like, "You want to do this for free?" Right. You know, it was never anything like that. But um, once I can pay, you know, I was, and some of them were like, "Don't pay, I, don't even talk to me about that. Mm-hmm. I'm just gonna play on your stuff because I like playing on your stuff." Um, which is fun and nice. But um, on this one, yeah, it did feel like a co- totally different experience because um, I was a new drummer. Michael Minkoff did all the drums. And we've been really good friends for a long time. He's like an old like family friend who's like really good friends with my uncles, really. And then we've just kind of been friends. Mm-hmm. And we've just gotten a lot closer over the years. And he plays drums in my uncle's band. And then finally I was like, you know do you want to just do them for this? And he was like, yeah, sounds great. And that was a great thing. It was wonderful to, to, I mean, he's all the way out in like Sugar Hill, Georgia. So, Mm -hmm. I mean, he's all the way over there. Um, I think a big part of this record was working with Sam Amati for for the guitar stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, Because I've done a lot of my own lead playing in the past. And even on this record, I still do some. But I'm just, I'm not really a guitarist. It's not really what I do. I'm certainly not an electric guitarist, I would say. Um, I get what you mean. It's nice to have someone with different ideas come in yeah. when it's not your strongest instrument. And they have, like, they're more, they're more fluent with it. Mm-hmm. You know, and 
when when Sam writes something, it's like, okay, I probably could play that if I sat here and practiced it, but you're just playing it. Mm-hmm. And so I'd rather just, it'd be like, I mean, I feel like Sam is to the guitar what I am to my violin, mm-hmm. where I can just pick it up and just play with anyone pretty much, and it will be pretty good. Like, yeah. It will just be fine. And this is probably the least violin you've had on a record, right? Um, well, I don't know. Actually, a lot of your records have been pretty pretty guitar heavy, I guess. They have, they? yeah. yeah. I w- and there is quite a bit of violin. It's in the mix, though. That's true. You know, it's included in, in various, like even on Baron Field. I mean, it's, mm-hmm. there's like a 16 violin arrangement that comes in in the middle. But all this other stuff is going on. So did, you, I, did you still record and mix this yourself? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, when you're Your saying, mixing is getting much better. It is better. getting better, yeah. I mean, it was never bad. <laughs> no, but... But I did not think you were DIY mixing this. Yeah, I, I did. Because yeah. everything sits really well. Well, I'd say this is the first record I used Logic Pro instead yeah. of GarageBand. Yeah. And that Gar- shows. I love GarageBand. GarageBand is amazing. I think mm-hmm. if you have GarageBand, use it. Mm-hmm. But Logic's definitely better. <laughs> Logic's better, yeah. And once, like, I mean... And once... You know, but I do love, the more you talk about it, you know, right now... I do love this idea that you've just been on this slow incline of improving those abilities. Yeah. Of, you know, you probably know how to use the boring stuff like compressors and things now yeah. much better. Yeah, than that, when you that's first, really what it yeah. is. And and at the end of, I mean, I, I think I even said this back when I did originally come on your show, where it was like, at the end of my life, I want you to be able to hear the um, maturation and growth of me as a human being, but also me as as an artist and also me is just like technically understanding what I'm doing mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and all those things. I want to see it just keep going that way until, yeah. you know, I'm not it's, here anymore. It's a good way to do it. I think so many people get hung up on things being perfect right at the start mm-hmm. that they just don't make things, you know? Yeah. I, and you can grow, you can get, yeah. I mean, even when, when, before we start recording, you're like, Oh, I see you've added some stuff to your setup. And it's like, I mean, yeah, you just you, keep, you yeah. just keep trying to get better, you right? Keep doing it, and yeah. eventually, you look back and you go, "Ooh, those were some horrible choices." That we <laughs> but you know, hey, we we put it out, whatever. You know, it works, it, and and that is the fun part is the growth. Yeah. I try one of the comics um, that I really enjoy around here. I won't say his name because I don't want to blow up his spot yet. Sure, if he, sure. I don't think he's released this yet. But we were doing um, some audio recordings of his live show. Uh-huh. And, you know, he wants to release a, an audio album and. Uh, we recorded four totally different shows. And, you know, most people do that hoping to, Comment. yeah, yeah. mix this the, this good. joke this was great, blah, blah, yeah. blah. Which we did, and it's fine. That's pretty much the standard. And for about, you know, two or three days, I was pushing them. I was like, man, can we just release these as four separate shows and just mm-hmm. release it as a weekend at this club, you know, and let people see the differences of how your your performance changes a little bit, how the audience changes, and and like almost pull back that curtain. And he, I, you know, I couldn't get him around to it. It's a lot to ask because, he, you know, they're trying to build their career, and that's yeah. not really a good marketing move. No, to show the parts where there were slip ups or. It's better for you those know. things to be bootlegged like fifty years from now. I know, <laughs> but but I do love the idea of watching the nitty gritty of how things no, work. It is. Oh, it's like so for much people fun. that are invested in it and mm-hmm. really want to know about it, it's like it's like these are the B sides yeah. to like a great band that I'll actually be really yeah. excited about once they get big. And that's the real problem, right? Is right. you're asking someone who's not big yet to do that. Yeah. It's like, buddy, I'm just trying to survive. I was like, need I to know. get like the first thing. Like, you know? I, yeah. I hope you get famous though. Like I have, all, have the, all this stuff. I yeah. have it all saved. It's, already. it's <laughs> staying on the hard drive. Yeah. I catalog all this stuff because it's like, man, if you do hit it, this could be so much fun for your diehard right. fans. You yeah. know? Um, and it is fun. Like it, I have like a, a record that kind of grows up because you know, everything I write, it's here first. Mm -hmm. And, um, I have, uh, I mean, even like, uh, Ricky Rochelle who plays all the wind instruments on Mm -hmm. the record with the exception of the trumpet. My friend Chris plays that, but Ricky, he was in Chicago. He's, he's on tour with Broadway. He was in Chicago for a couple of days. I was like, Hey man, what if you just come over and we can just get all your parts done in like two days or something. And Mm -hmm. he was like, sounds good to me. And I managed to hit record at some point. And I literally have the recording of us writing the parts that the literal takes that are on the record Mm -hmm. and the way that we we figured out what he would do and all this stuff. And to me, it's like it's fun for me to have it. And it's fun probably for him to see it, too. Mm -hmm. But it's also like, well, I'm going to set it aside because it feels like also investing in like whoever is going to be like a fan that really wants to know about this stuff. It's Mm -hmm. like, okay, well, I'm going to have it and we'll we'll save it. 
hey, maybe one day yeah. I'll put it out there. I think everyone right now should be doing that because this is the the most access we have ever had in human history to be able to record things. You can record video and audio. Yeah. I mean, your phone will do 4K, 60 frames per second. It will be high quality audio. If you don't want to do that, even just your voice note memo stuff. It's really good. That is better than, the, the, like, if Elvis had had this phone when he was recording, <laughs> they might have used it. Well, so I you was know? watching Rick Rubin and Paul McCartney. Oh, they, were, wow. they were talking. It was this great series. I think it's on Hulu. And they just It's like six episodes of them oh, talking. Oh, wow. okay. I'm gonna and check Paul, that uh, there's a group. There's a group called the Beatles, yeah. And he was <laughs> like, well, you know, we had to make all the, all the tunes really catchy. Because if they weren't, we couldn't remember them. <laughs> we get we get to the studio and be like, "Oh no, I don't know how it goes." And John would be like, "Okay, I don't know, you know." Yeah. And I was like, "Wait, that's hilarious." Yeah. Because no wonder Beatles songs are so catchy. Yeah. They had to be. They literally, literally, the medium of of making a record dictated that this has to be yeah. memorable for you right now, dude. I can't remember shit. Like, <laughs> if I don't record it the first time, yeah. like when I think, oh. I, oh, there's something. Oh, fuck. The first thing I go to is not my instrument. The first thing, I get my mm-hmm. phone, I hit record, and then I'm like, okay, now I'm going to touch it. Because whatever I do when I touch it, I'm not going to remember it. Yeah. And even if I remember some version, it's not going to be what it was. Yeah. Like, I can't, I got to f- get it exactly what it is so I know, you know. I'm not even actively trying to make a record of any kind. I just enjoy playing, and I have just voice memo after voice memo after voice memo of just 30 seconds of this 20 yeah. seconds of that yeah because like you said you get an earworm that you like and you're like ooh, this is fun you pick up your guitar real quick or you just hum it even you're like i'll hum it and yeah. i'll figure it out later on guitar yes and yeah i mean knowing you have that technology now it's a it's huge like comfort just make some stuff you yeah. know yeah and that too yeah my wife this this week she was like do you think you'll ever be like be a writer and i was like uh i don't know i feel like i like on the page, yeah, writer? Yeah. Okay. And I have written a lot. I mean, I have probably... I think even last time I was on here, I was talking about the, this book that I've been working on. And I, I think I have somewhere between 75 and 100 pages on it. Um, but it's like, I don't know what my voice is as a writer. Mm-hmm. And when I go back and read these things, I mean, some of them still, they're good. They hold up and they make me laugh. But it's still like, no, this is too... Like Kierkegaardian, it's too um, informed by the fact that I just read too much of everything before, like mm. the 19th century, and that's basically how I know how to how to read and mm-hmm. write is just that. And it, I, that isn't great. Um, it doesn't really communicate well, and it doesn't reach people where they are, and it's not accessible, and it's not. I need to find a voice that is those things, and I feel like. Or do you just need to do it? the way that your musical path has been, which is just write some shit. Well, so, and, and Cynthia, maybe you hate it. Cynthia was like, maybe if you, you don't it. start, though, like mm-hmm. if you don't start putting things out there and writing them, then you're never going to, it's not going to happen, mm-hmm. you know? And I was like, yeah, that's a good point. Also keep in mind, as I just talked about, we're in this amazing time of technology where all these things are possible. Mm-hmm. We are also getting this big gap between people who would would severely judge what you're talking about right now but the majority of people are getting worse and worse and worse in terms of reading writing grammar speaking so the the list of people that would ever judge you too harshly is shrinking every generation you know it's uh like it's just i mean you every every single post you read you're just like wow everything's a grammatical error nowadays. yeah everything oh, is. it's a complete mess yeah it's a shit show so i think yeah, yeah you go for it you just write it yeah, yeah, I think I think I do need to do more of that. Yeah. I wrote a, a blog a long time ago that would um, I would interview a musician, and we kind of centered it around their history as a as a. My goal was to promote bands without promoting a band. Interesting. So I thought we'll focus on a member of the band, the instrument they play, and their backstory, and mm-hmm. then their current setup. So it was a mixture of kind of like gear nerding out and then also how you got into playing and this stuff, kind of stuff. Yeah. And at the time I had a good friend who was kind of editing all of, you know, I'd, I'd send something over and they'd go, this sounds weird. I don't like this. But, and they would be a really hands-on editor. Yeah. And it made everything sound really well. Everything. I, I liked the way it read. I liked the way it was, but it always did feel like it was pulling a little bit of myself away from it because mm, it was corrected. Right. And it's like, well, even if I speak poorly, even if I write poorly, that is me. That's me right now. Yeah, yeah, and that might improve over the years. And this will just be 
me for this moment. Yeah. You know, unless it's just some really horrible error that yeah. is hard to understand. Yeah, we definitely need to work on that. Yeah, right? yeah. And so I I liked it being really pristine and polished, but then I realized, wow, I can only sound this way if this person's editing. This. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so that's not great either. Right. Um, so, yeah, I think there's a, it's just like music. There's There's a little bit of, beauty and authenticity and those tiny little errors that right. are you. Because right. if you talked to me in person, I'm going to make those same mistakes yeah, when I'm that's speaking. Just, that's just happening. It's just going to yeah. happen. Yeah. So right. we don't just like pause the conversation. Yeah. And, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so how much you said you've written about 75 to a hundred pages. Yeah. Do you want to write a book? How, what, what length of, yeah, that's do you the thing. Write? It's like, um, it, it, it was, it started out as, uh, like kind of, a way to extend the self-medicating therapy that the music was for mm-hmm. me um, because there were certain things that I felt like I couldn't really say in a song, you know? And so I was like, well, I need to get this fucked up thought out of my head mm-hmm. and I need I can't put it in a song because it's too much or it just doesn't work. So I'll just put it on the page. And so there's a lot of that. And just, they're just, I mean, I, I like to say it, it's a, uh, Bomethian is at Bomethius is at his best when uh, he's insightful, <laughs> but it's spelled I N C. Yeah, you're inciting yeah, yeah. a riot, you know. <laughs> yeah, and so I what I like is is an observation about something that you can't see it any other way once you've heard it, but it also like deeply offends you if mm-hmm. you if you're beholden to tradition or, or or certain values, you know that I I've grown to see is kind of ironic and ridiculous and mm-hmm. you know so that that is what Bometheus kind of represents in a certain way is like he just wants to show you these things that make you uncomfortable and a little sad and then he was like come laugh with me about yeah. it you know yeah like it's a little bit of a dick move but then you guys are friends afterwards yeah a lot of that <laughs> and I think for uh, a lot of my friends even the ones that like especially the ones that played on this record the way our relationship started was a lot of that mm-hmm. where it was like you're kind of fucked up i can't believe you said that <laughs> and it's like yeah do you want to come <laughs> yeah. yeah that's hilarious the uh i know you said you know uh before we turn the mics on a lot of this album is very heavy very deep yeah. but since you brought this up this kind of uh you know internal tussle with with thi- things yeah. in your life um, I think the song that speaks to me the most on this record that I really, really, really enjoy is uh, Mother, Mother, Dearest. <laughs> and you don't have to talk about the song if you don't want to. Yeah. But And I, I hate being a person that says, you know, this is what this song is about. Sure. But there's some definite clear points where you're talking about God and your yeah. and mom. is. I'm guessing your mom? or uh, sure. a-, a mom. A sure. mom. Yeah, that's kind of how I took it as well. Is it, It's not a strict anything. But I loved the rebellious nature of that song, while at the same time, it's a very comforting sound. Mm. You know, and uh, like I said, I grew up with a lot of, of punk rock, a lot of rebellion. Everything was about making people, you know, whew, ah, like the right. gas yeah. of that. Yeah. Whereas this song is has the same intention, but it's done just much sweeter. You yeah, know, no, I, I really, really enjoy it. Wow, and then I'm, I'm so also glad. just a sucker for a good piano. Oh, you know? nice. But yeah, um, yeah, the the lyrics of that song for for such a something that sounds fairly lighthearted when it's coming in, mm-hmm. it's really well done. Thank I really you, like man. it. I appreciate it. Yeah. yeah, no, I mean it comes from a very raw place, and it's um, it's very real. But I I think the only thing really that I have to say about that song is that it's a prayer. Mm. That's what it is, and it's um, it's a hope, you know, and, and it it does seem perhaps like a little heavy handed or um, like a bit much, but there is that that sense when you're growing up, or it's like, is is God is God like these people? And if He is, I don't think He likes me very much, you know, and I I'm pretty terrified of that. And it isn't so much I don't believe in God. It's just if that's who God is, I don't want anything to do with him, you know? Um, that's that's always been my view of how anyone tells you a spiritual being, whatever religion you want to choose. Yeah. You know, but just because we're here in Texas, in America, you know, it's it's uh, Christianity. Sure. And the, the stuff that always made me just go, oh, fuck that, that's not, was... <laughs> When they talked about how 
you know, Jesus and God are basically the equivalent of like a needy 13 year old. <laughs> Where it's like, I need you to tell me you love me. Yeah. <laughs> I need you to tell me. If you don't tell me you love me, you're not coming into the club. Yeah, right, right. Do you understand that? Right, right. I need to know you love me completely yeah. with no questions. Yeah. And then I will give you everything I have to offer. Right. And it's like, well, you know, the stories of these people sacrificing themselves and, you know, washing poor people's feet mm -hmm. and then being the total opposite, you start to realize... This feels like what somebody said God would want you to be like. Right. And I, you know, because I always felt Regardless like. Regardless of what God said. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. that could be any God you want to choose. I'm right. not telling you which God is correct. And, um, you know, right. but the whole idea of so this person that created everything, that knows everything in my heart, all my thoughts, all my intentions. I need you to say the word. Yeah. But I need you to fucking say it. Say, like, sound it out. To totally false, right? Yeah. No, ridiculous. And, and so then. You do. There is that point when you're a child where you realize, oh, you know, the the messenger really messes up a lot of this stuff. Yeah. Messes up everything. Of course. Yeah. And that maybe there shouldn't be strict rules on any of these religions. It should all be guidance. Yeah. You know, it should all just be oh, we're just we're just trying the best here. Yeah. Okay. And we think some of these stories could help us be good people. Okay. And that's I don't know what's out there. We're just striving yeah, for right, this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> On top of all this, man, I'm just trying to pay the electric bill. Right. Do you mind? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it's like, we're just asking you not to murder anyone. Just don't do that. Yeah. And I think there's also mm. just a sense of like, whatever doesn't lead you to love God or love your neighbor better and, and well mm -hmm. and to love yourself, fuck it. Just yeah. get rid of it. That's Absolutely. Not, that is not what, what it means to live a life that is well examined or healthy or fruitful mm. or good in any way. Yeah. So if it isn't doing those things, I don't want anything to do with it. Yeah, it's hard to it's hard to talk about religion period anymore. Yeah. Because people even even atheists, you know, sure. it's just it's very strong now. Yeah. And I love astronomy. Astronomy is a huge hobby of mine. Mm -hmm. And you know, explaining to someone how vast and empty the universe is yeah. and how little we know about it. Right. And this is what we know, and this is what we believe. It's like there's a lot of similarities to what yeah. these other folks are saying. Right. So then you feel very hypocritical, and you know, and I, I, I know the scientific method is different, which is we're always trying to figure out what it is rather than saying thousands of years ago we learned what it was, and we will not <laughs> and change now our minds. We know exactly right. what it is, yeah. and that's the main difference. But I think you know the foundation of all of that is here's what we think we know. Truthfully, none of us know the answer to any of it. The yeah. only way you learn is when you die. Right. And, and we also don't know. and also being comfortable too. I think a big thing for me was was realizing and Kierkegaard was a big help in this was like doubt is a posture of faith. It's okay to doubt is good. Mm -hmm. Doubt uh, uh, the guy that married uh, my wife and I his name is Martin Bond. He uh one time he was like doubt's like the the salt that you put on top of a chocolate chip cookie. If you don't have the salt on there, that's not a good cookie. It's like a pretty good, okay, fine, it's okay. But it's like you got to have the doubt on there. That's way better. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. You don't like you don't want to blindly believe anything, do you? No. Yeah, and I see these really nice, sweet, well-intentioned people who just have those and you grew up religious, so you know what I'm talking about, sure. but when you see adults who just at every little thing they're like, "God is good. God is amazing." Mm -hmm. And you know they're just trying to put out that positivity, but sure. at the same time in my mind, the jerk in me is like, you're kind of a sucker, aren't you? Yeah. You know? <laughs> you, you know? <laughs> well, one of my favorite Randy Newman songs. Mm -hmm. um, oh, shoot. I can't remember the name of the record, which makes me so sad. But the <laughs> the song is it's called God's Song. Okay. And that's why I, I love Mankind. Is I think it's parenthetical. And it's on the same it's on the same record with another song called He Gives Them All He Gives Us All His Love, which is a beautiful song that to me is one of the most like that's one of the most spiritual experiences I have listening to music is listening to Randy Newman play that song. Mm. He gives us all his love. It's so beautiful and it's so good and it's so it's so filled with the the contradiction that we see of of famine and pestilence and and violence and all these other things in the world, but then like being aware that there is goodness and there is, there is this love between people and this stuff that binds us together. And, and we see growth in people and we see people change and it's so beautiful. And then there is all this 
just awful, gross stuff that we wish would go away. And but there's something wrapped up in all of it, you know, that's good and and true. And then this other song is is God's song, and it's like super uh, uh, like uh, jazzy, and it's just him at the piano again, and he. he it's like the darkest, most Calvinistic vision of a God <laughs> where he's like, I take from you your children and you say, how blessed are we? That's why I love mankind. You <laughs> really need me. <laughs> oh, That's wow. why I love mankind. And I mean, I listen to that one and I weep Yeah, because it's like, oh, damn it. It if, could be that way. That's who it is. I'm so upset. And but then I listen to the other one and I weep too because I'm like, oh, I really hope it's like this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what a cl- I'm gonna have to listen to both of those. I'll send them to you. Yeah, yeah. That uh, that's one of my favorite conversations to have, but it's hard to find a good person to have that conversation with, yeah. right? Because yeah. it's really easy to parrot so many things, no matter sure. which side you're on, yeah. rather than have any kind of original well, then thought. Really get to know what that mm-hmm. person feels and thinks. Yeah. yeah, because I think everyone's afraid of saying something. That offends everybody. Yeah. And then, and, like, yeah, you don't have any listeners anymore. Yeah. Well, but it's happens. like you would be offended about something that neither of us have any factual information about. <laughs> yeah. So it's pointless. Like, yeah. we're just, you know, for me, my love of, of, of astronomy is what makes me so frustrated when you hear that they passed, you know, a $1.7 trillion budget in America mm-hmm. and it's almost a trillion dollars for defense. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I argue those numbers all you want, but me, it's like, man, could we put five hundred billion a year towards exploration of mm-hmm. the universe? Mm-hmm. And that can be in theoretical studies, that can be in satellites, that can be manned missions, whatever you want. But you're on a little ball floating through infinity mm-hmm. in all directions, as far as we know. Yeah, and we have a very limited understanding of all of that. So even if you are religious. The more we pump into studying this vacuum of space that we exist in, the more we might find out who that creator is, if there is one, right? So even from a theological perspective, these scientific studies could help your cause. Yeah. You know, and... um, Did you see that thing, uh, the Nobel Prize physics winners? No. uh, The quantum entanglement? Oh, yeah. Where they proved that there is, in fact, one thing that travels faster than the speed of light, Mm -hmm. and it's, uh, it's the consciousness shared between matter what is that that you know what i'm saying it's, for, for people don't know who don't know what entanglement is look it up i'm going to give you cliff notes but basically two objects in the universe can become entangled it can be a particle a very tiny particle and you can put them billions of light years across the universe yeah. and they will behave at the same time in the same when one is affected the other one is affected <laughs> they know that that happens but they don't know why and none of us know why and that, that's what I mean by let's invest some money and figure that out yeah. because that is insane. Because now we've proven that it's there. Yeah. Or if it's yeah. some silly parlor trick, we need to know that. Yeah. <laughs> we, yeah. we need to know that like, oh, no, no, it's just because this idiot. That's all it is. But for me, yeah. it's like um, the things that the, the mystics for thousands of years and all these beautiful minds and people that have that have shared their perception of reality. It's like they knew Mm -hmm. you know there's like this interconnected interwoven reality that is around all of us and shaping everything and everything is we're all it's all communicative it's all participation you know i think when you understand science and i'm not claiming to understand it well but i want to understand it really well and i i really try to learn as much as i can that's what's interesting to me about it is the more you try to break it down to a granular scientific explanation, Mm -hmm. the more unexplainable it becomes a lot of times. And we're back to the mystical. And we're back to the (laughs) woo-woo, ha-ha. But but now we we can say, scientifically, we have shown this might be magic. (laughs) (laughs) This might be magic, people. Okay? We might have real-life magic happening. I Um, saw this great... So it's like, just study more of that, would you? Yeah, yeah, just put stuff in it. (laughs) I was going to say, um, just before we, we move on completely, I think we kind of have, but when we were talking about um, how we have these and you can just record stuff, the last track on the album, that's what it is. Yeah, yeah. I, f- I figured that's what it was, that yeah. you kind of did a quick throwback to that style. And I, it, the, the reason, and it's a farewell song as well. It's yeah, so much more personal that way. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and like I tried to re-record it like five times, mm. and it was like, this is not... This doesn't work. It's just not good. Mm-hmm. And also the feeling of 
like where that song was coming from and what it's about and all those things. It was so raw when I wrote it and recorded it the first time. And every time after that, it felt like I was just trying to recapture that. I wasn't trying to sing the song, you mm-hmm. know? So it was mm-hmm. like, leave it. We're just doing that. I have a song like that on my phone that I really love. We we had this condo here in Dallas. It was a little two-bedroom condo that we loved. And um, we before we moved out of it, we renovated it because we wanted to make some money, right? And one of our choices that we thought looked good but was also budget conscious, like basically we were just trying to – we didn't have a connection to this home anymore for a bunch of random reasons we're not going to get into. But I was like, I just wanted to sell and make money to get to the next thing. So we ended up putting all this porcelain wood look tile through the entire place because it's waterproof. It's it's not going to break. It's cheaper than installing these uh, wood floors and carpet throughout. And it looked we found a really good deal on it. And it gave, when I was in the spare bedroom, it gave this incredible reverb throughout the entire apartment because we had everything out of there. We were moving out. It's just an empty so it's thing. Just the, yeah. Yeah. And so literally I'm just sitting on, you know, a bucket or something with an acoustic guitar, set the phone down on the floor, but kind of far away where it's getting all that yeah, reverb yeah, yeah. that's just echoing in and out of these other rooms. And I, you know, that's just a song for me. If I ever were to record it and put it out for some reason, that version's still going to be what I love. And it, you'll always be chasing that. You know what I mean? And um, there's just something about a space like that, a a room, when you're in a room in a perfect moment in time, and it's not for anybody but you at that moment, and then you listen back and you're like, I I really like that. I really like that. Uh, And then... I also have no desire to share it with anyone. It's like, I just oh, well, enjoy it. You that's, know? that's beautiful. I that's just really, really like cool it. to get to that, yeah. like to have that innate sensibility. I feel like my wife has that innate sensibility where mm-hmm. like she can appreciate something good and beautiful that she's done or that she has and feels no obligation whatsoever to need to publicize it mm-hmm. or share it with anyone or really do anything about it. Like, she and, and there's like a certain degree of um of level um secure um just a healthy sense of yourself and your boundaries and all these things that like when i first met her it's like how do you how do you do be this <laughs> like cuz i i think i'm starting to get like i've one of the new things that is on this record particularly it's the first record to come out after me starting therapy mm. like being in therapy i mean it's like ah oh, damn it i should have done this a long time ago <laughs> <laughs> and there were things where it's like uh, even you know my therapist he was like uh wow you've done a lot of work you've actually you've actually done a lot of work how did you do that and like i did it all in my music mm. you can go see it and you can see all the fucked up shit and it's trying to get out and it is getting out but it's like I also need a professional to mm. to to guide to guide some of that, you know. I was talking about this on one of my previous episodes. I'm a huge fan of therapy. Yeah. I think people should do it. Yeah, me but too. I've personally not ever gone. Really? Because I I, get, I have some friends like this or that are like big proponents of it, but like, nah, it's not for me. Don't well, me. how do you decide this is the right therapist for me? How did you go, mm. I'm gonna go to this therapist? Um, because my big fear is you know, just because you have that title, you might be a horrible therapist oh, who yeah. gives me terrible advice. Sure, you know? absolutely. Yeah, um, it was just a lot of Googling and reading websites mm-hmm. and kind of what they what their strengths were in, how long they'd practiced, um, the sorts of things that they had seen, the different environments they'd worked in. There's a lot of that and just kind of discerning through all of that, like, I think this might be good. When and you were looking, did you, were you saying, you know, I don't like this about me, this is what I want to change, or there are these things I want to get through? Yeah, that. Ha- that's what more of what it was? Yeah. And then, so you're just looking at their website and said, oh, they I think they, they understand got where, I'm, hmm. where I am right now, and I think they can help me, yeah. I think I'm very unaware of what I would like to address in therapy mm-hmm. if I went. The, the the biggest thing I would want to address, which most people find hard to believe, is uh, anger. Yeah, interesting. Just rage. Because I don't fly off the handle or anything, but, man, minor things. My wife sees it more than anyone because I'm obviously more the most comfortable around her. Yeah. So I'm the most comfortable if something in public's really bothering me, like, you know, letting go. And uh, the only thing that's really helped me with it this far is uh, I love Bill Burr, the <laughs> comedian. 
and he is an ang- he was a very very angry guy. Yeah, he's, he's now less down angry. A little bit. He goes to therapy for his anger. Yeah. But listening to him is almost like my pseudo therapist. You know, really. I'm funny. just like, oh, there is somebody who's angry like that, and because yeah. you'll hear him going, or like, like Lewis Black, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's a guy. Well, Bill Burr. I was listening to his podcast for years. You know, while he was having his kid and. And uh, it's like the first year or two when he had his kid, he's like, you hear him on his podcast, which I don't know if you've ever listened to him. Oh, yeah, I've listened Okay, to so it's just him ranting yeah, for an hour. Yeah, it's hilarious. And he's like, oh, i got to get my fucking shit together. I can't be yeah. like this. I've got a kid coming in here. i got to get my fucking rage under control. I can't say the fucking yeah. fuck word. You know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so you're like, okay, okay, yeah, he's right. Anger isn't healthy. I need to... Ad- so but he was kind of like my therapist. Sure, sure. No, <laughs> and those are good things to find. Um, yeah. No, my my bit about Bill Burr is that he perpetually sounds like the guy in downtown Chicago who gets out of his car and yells, Is this your car? Are you going to move your car? Can you move your fucking car? You, like, that's just Bill Burr in my head every time. Oh, man, I love that guy. I think he's going to go down as my favorite comic ever. Really? He, he, I love a lot of different comics. Yeah. And I, and I hate even ranking have anything. To rank him, yeah. But he makes me laugh on such a visceral level, Mm -hmm. you know, where I truly feel like I connect and know this person, even though I've never met them. Yeah. And I think everybody finds that person, you know? Oh yeah. And uh, there's so many comics that I love and there's people who have made me laugh harder than him. Sure. But I just connect. But he's the consistency. I connect with his material. Yeah. There's something about his life. Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to think, I feel like for me, it's like, it, I guess it changes all the time. Mm-hmm. Like, I remember in high school, it was Anthony Jeselnik. Like, oh, that was yeah. Thing, he's you know? incredible. But then at a certain point, it almost became like Eminem to me, where it was like, uh, I think we've forgotten how to like grow through our art form, and now it's just about technique. Like, yeah, I felt I like Thoughts that. and Prayers was just a lot of like, look, I can do this again. And I was like, I don't yeah. really feel like this is going anywhere. Like Mike Birbiglia, for example... Mm-hmm huge amount of growth in mm-hmm. his stuff and it becomes very personal it's almost different than comedy in a lot of ways i could see that i would love to talk to somebody like jesselnick you know it, it would be hard to ask those questions without offending mm-hmm. yeah but i feel like it would be he very con- i think he's constructive enough <laughs> yeah that he might be angry but later would go like that was a good conversation <laughs> yeah. um but you do wonder do i think you're not growing you know, because the first time I ever saw you perform that way, I'd never seen anything like that. Sure. But now that I know how you are, it it's feels like a little stale. Yeah. But then again, there's so many people who've never That's true. experienced it That's true. that it's probably going to blow like their minds. So Let's is it, it is it the comic or the musician? Or do they need to grow more, or am I just a little spoiled because I know your pattern now? Yeah. Um, that that's a good point. But I don't know because yeah. comedy is different too, right? Because musically. When people change styles quite a bit, they really get people. People don't like that. Yeah. For instance, uh, the band Chicago. Right. Have you ever heard Chicago Transit Authority? No. No. Okay. So Chicago is Chicago Transit Authority. Okay. And I'm still learning kind of the history, but it was in '67, '68, or '69, somewhere around there. Um, Chicago Transit Authority came out, and it's kind of like an experimental, like. Prog rock, okay. um, jazzy uh, uh, band. I feel like I would like that more than oh, I. Than it's Chicago. incredible. Okay, I need to it's go got it's got the drums, bass, everything. The guitar is phenomenal. If you like Hendrix, this yeah. guitar is going to blow your mind. Mm-hmm. Hendrix was claiming that the lead guitarist of this band was better than him. Oh, Hendrix right. was a fan of these guys, and he brought them on the road as openers. Okay, I did. But not they know also that. have a, uh, I think it's a three piece horn section <laughs> that does incredible arrangements. Um, I'll send I'll send you the link to yeah, them yeah, and yeah. so you can check them out. So anyway, Chicago Transit Authority was this kind of psychedelic, mind blowing rock thing, and then later down the line became fucking Chicago, oh, who has wow. the elevator hits even. Right, and it's just this, and they were n- unapologetic. Um, now that guitarist at one point he died, but they had already written some kind of Chicago hits. It oh, wasn't okay. like the band changed totally. Right, um, but there is some debate that if he was still alive, it would the band still be a little far. more rocky? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But the members that were through the rest of the transformation, they're all like, no, yeah. we've always wanted to push this, the limits of our style and yeah. we don't want to play we'll the same going. thing. Yeah. And that gives those people who are like, no, man, once they put out those records, they fucking sucked. They sucked. 
right? And that's the same argument with Jesselnik. It's like, if he tried to change something, would we be like, wow, he's so brilliant? Or would yeah. we go, stick to what you know, man. Yeah. <laughs> stick to what you know, you piece of shit. Um, because you just don't know. And right now, that that yeah. bit is, is paying his bills, and right. he does it better than anyone ever has. Yeah, no, you know? for sure. And, I mean, God, he has some of the... I love that comic. He's not, like I said... He's made me laugh harder than Bill Burr sometimes, but I still would take Bill Burr any day yeah. just because I connect. Yeah. But the stuff Jesselnik writes is so phenomenal. No, there's great so stuff. So phenomenal. Oh, I mean, and you just great stuff. You never see the twist. Yeah. Even when I know like he's gonna give me this twist, I'm like, oh shit! I didn't. I didn't know it was gonna go that way though. I feel like I. For me, the thing is, I, I re- I've had to exercise thinking that way mm. about just as a person. Like that's. There was a long period where my thoughts just on a normal day were that dark <laughs> yeah that um i would finish the sentence with jeselnik the first time i saw i saw this stuff <laughs> so it, it it for me it actually did become like yeah man i've been here it's not fun let's yeah. not stay here yeah and for him like he's a character on stage i get it it's mm-hmm. different and i think maybe for me it's like no i'm trying to recover from this that's interesting yeah yeah, yeah that's interesting yeah that's uh I mean that's why it's art, right? No, for sure. Yeah. It's everybody different. I think and this is definitely not a popular opinion. It, Louis CK. I love Louis CK. He is I know that that's I think he's my favorite. I know that that's polarizing. Them. Yeah. I think if he didn't have that setback with uh you know all the inappropriate stuff that he has admitted to, yeah. um that he would be considered the greatest. Yeah. The abs- what I like about him um but have you heard I'm sorry? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I took a lot of heat on social media a couple years ago when he was first starting to do shows again. Mm -hmm. Um, Just from this show, knowing comics uh, that work at the improv, like as servers or things. Yeah, yeah. They Louis C.K. came in and did, I think, four shows at the Addison Improv, which is a club. It's not a theater. Sure. And, you know, he's one of the world best comics ever. Yeah. And uh, they were like, Dude, they're not really making a big deal about this, but they're doing shows. They're not going to advertise it, but it's right. on the website. Right. And so immediately went and bought tickets. And I uh, asked my wife, I was like, how do you feel about going to this? Because I want to go. She's like, oh, no, no, no. I want to go. He's hilarious. I was yeah. Like, okay. So I got the approval from my my wife. Yeah, that you're, you're good to go. On yeah. board. And she came with me, and we were both just blown away. So I think he was working on a lot of the I'm Sorry material on those tours. Yeah. But to see someone at that skill level 30 feet away mm-hmm. in a club yeah. where I'll never see them again. Right. Working on material that's going to be in a special. Yeah. And it's still better than so Most. much material that I've ever seen. Yeah. And it's not even finished yet. Yeah. I mean, it's incredible. Yeah. It's incredible. But what I've always what I've always loved about him is that he he goes for a topic that is so so uncomfortable. Yeah. There's an incredible Saturday night live uh monologue. I've seen yeah, I've seen it. The one where he's talking about pedophilia yeah, the and whole how time. great it must be. He just keeps going. Oh my yeah, the god. Whole but time. and it's like man, the crowd definitely felt uncomfortable with that one, but the premise of the joke yeah, is <laughs> phenomenal. Like the and then the fact that you had the nerve to even come out on stage going, I think I can swing this. Yeah. I think I can make I think I can compare pedophilia to a candy bar <laughs> yeah. and get away with this. Amazing. And it's like, you know, the joke is never going to be a household favorite, but it's an incredible mm-hmm. joke. Yeah. And that's why I love him. It's like, man, he is going after stuff that other people won't touch. I think, yeah, and that's always kind of been my, my thing. And he, I don't think he does it for shock value. He's never just like, and then this, and yeah. this outrageous thing. It's written very well, usually. I, yeah, I, I've listened to a lot of his like recent interviews, and he's talked a lot about like every bit that I have that you think is probably a good bit, it started as a really shitty bit (laughs) where people, like, when I'd start, they'd be like, I don't want to listen to this, you know? (laughs) He was like, every single one of them started like that. So I just, I have all these things where it's like, I'm pretty sure there's something here, and I'm just going to keep going until I find where it is, you know? Can you imagine the rough cuts of something like the pedophilia joke? I can't. Yeah, it's probably not great. That's the type of bit where you're trying that out in a club and somebody wants to kick your ass afterwards. Yeah, right. It's. I yeah. mean, it's dangerous. It's not great. No. <laughs> to that dangerous joke point, I'll have to send you this uh, clip of Jesselnik roasting Mike Tyson. I've seen it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That yeah. where he says, uh, 
He says something about his face tattoo and his religion, and the face tattoo being the second the dumbest second thing. The second dumbest yeah. thing you've done after converting it's like, to wow, Islam. Yeah. You said that to one of the scariest men on the planet. I, and, and a guy that has been known to just stand up and punch people in yeah, the face. Yeah, a guy like, who bit someone's ear off. Yeah. He's not, you know, just we hope he's it. cool with it. Yeah. But maybe you strike a nerve. Patrice O'Neill, too, that guy. Yeah. Man. He, uh, you know, um, amongst the, the famous comics, they all claim, you know, if he Everybody was alive, he's the man. Yeah. yeah, that he was too lost too soon, you know, and he still still had all this material. So, right. Yeah, I mean, I didn't really know much about Patrice O'Neill until I was listening to Bill Burr's podcast and when he was hyping him up, and yeah. then I went back and started watching stuff. And it's because like, I think wow. there are a lot of clips where Bill Burr and Patrice are are on air together. Well, I think they were really close friends because yeah. Bill Burr does a Patrice O'Neill benefit show every oh, year to raise awesome. money for his family. That's awesome. Yeah. So, so uh, I think they were really, really tight. Yeah. But all right, enough about comedy. Oh, man, <laughs> I know. I can talk about comedy forever. <laughs> I mean, I, I think there's all these parallels do, with comedy and bit, music. Though. I have a bit I'm trying to work on. Uh, well, I, I have, okay, I have two. One of them is, uh, <laughs> so I went, I went and voted for the first time. Uh, don't blame me. I had a poor upbringing. Um, but I was in there and I sent it to my wife and I got the Scantron, you know, and I started filling it in. I looked at her, I was like, I think I'm going to fail this test. <laughs> I don't think we're going to do well on this. Uh, and then I have another <laughs> one uh, about um, nostalgia. Okay. And how Bometheus is nostalgic for a childhood that he never had. And, uh, and the 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 story the illustration i have is uh one of my favorite places to go as a kid was uh the museum where my grandfather worked for 40 years as the curator of taxidermy and uh whenever i went to the museum with grandpa we would enter through the faculty lot which was underneath the building big parking garage and he had to like show his badge to security and then you go in well in that parking garage were the dumpsters for the building and so there's this putrid sweet bizarre smell that filled the air when you went to go into the museum and to me as a kid I didn't know that was the dumpster and just like rotting trash that was there for a long time (laughs) in the cold you know I just thought that's the smell of going to the museum it's a weird (laughs) smell it means we're gonna go see like dinosaurs being put together and things like this and so it wasn't until I was much much older I think I was in New York City or something and I smelled it again I was like what we're not going to the museum what is this (laughs) <laughs> and I realized this is the fucking dumpster. Just this New is New what York a City. dumpster <laughs> smells like. And so nostalgia for me is realizing that the dumpster was what was creating the aroma I thought I was excited about as a kid. <laughs> well, when are you going to do some open mics? I know. I don't know. Um, <laughs> Chicago's got a comedy scene. I Yeah, they do. I, I, I'm I planning on doing some improv classes. Oh, really? This, this summer. Oh, wow. I think... Um, That's going to be exciting. Yeah, I think that'll be a fun, like, kind of like get into it a little bit because the idea you know i i i try to make people laugh the whole time i'm on stage with my stuff Mm -hmm. but i mean that was the other thing that that old woman that grabbed me she said and young man i need you to add to your cv that you're a comedian (laughs) you ain't no singer songwriter you're a comedian what she said (laughs) you know and that was really nice and encouraging to hear but it's like if you get on stage and i don't have my guitar it's like oh no i can only use this and i have to I'm telling you, man. It's a different thing. Th- that's one thing I've learned from this show. As somebody with a, a musician's background, comics have it harder. Oh yeah, you're alone. Yeah, and there's nothing to take the there, tension away. No, you know, because how many musicians have you seen try to riff a little between a song and it doesn't land, and they're like, oh well, here's another one, and they play a song, and they're great, and, and we then get it's into fine. the song, and we're past yeah. the moment, right? For comedians, it's just silence. Yeah, I like to. It's Oof. that it's that awkward, horrible time where a musician thinks they're funnier than they are, mm-hmm. but then they can't also do music. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's incredible. That goes back to me, you know, trying to talk to uh, talk that comic into releasing the four sets yeah, instead yeah, of one. Yeah, yeah, and I've realized I enjoy seeing the pain right Mm -hmm. and not in like a malicious way no it's just like watching it yeah become what it's gonna be because then because i've gotten to the point now even with this podcast i've seen a lot of these people that when i started the podcast they were open micers and they had terrible bits interesting and now years into this podcast you're watching them and they've molded those bits into funny material yeah 
and you're like, whoo, okay, they've grown. This is exciting. Yeah. And so for me, I want... And you were there. Yeah. Like from the beginning. Yeah. And I want people to go to the open mics with me and see it be horrendous. And start... But go to a thing. lot of shows with me. So two years later, yeah. which is a huge commitment to ask of anyone, like, do you want to go to shows with me for <laughs> two years? <laughs> and not good shows. They're going to be... I would, I would go. They're going to be pretty bad shows yeah. that we're going to. Um, but then two years later, you're like, oh, man, they worked it out. They're, Look at they're, how they're really doing. funny now. Yeah. And uh, I tried taking my wife to an open mic, and she's like, I grind my teeth through the whole... I, she oh, just ground her teeth man. through the whole thing because she felt so bad for it them. Makes, and, yeah, my wife yeah. is like that. Where any When yeah. she's going to see anyone she knows perform, she's just a nervous mm. wreck because she's yeah. like, ah, oh, this could be such a disaster for them. Mm-hmm. I'm going to have so much secondhand... Embar- for her, it's like, it might as well be firsthand embarrassment. Yeah, yeah that's how... Where me, I'm sitting there... I'm like rooting. I'm, <laughs> I'm giving you. I'm giving you like a fake smile. I want I you to see it. In your I eyes want too. you to. Like you like, really believe. You got yeah, it. It's so great. I think you're gonna do this. Yeah. <laughs> and, and like they'll have a setup, and I'm like, they'll they'll, they'll bring a setup in, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they okay, just, and then they yeah. give you something terrible, and you're like, we'll get it next time. You know, it's good yeah. effort. Good. You're looking around the room. You're like, it's it's something. Yeah. <laughs> He's piecing it together. <laughs> so yeah, wow. I do. I do love that. But uh, the podcast is—it's a double edge like that because I love watching and I love promoting the things that I enjoy. Yeah. Um, and then as it's grown, you know, I at, on every show I invite people like, hey, if you do this, like, hit me up. I'd love to come check it out. And so that means now for all the people that I love, you know, there's more people that you don't hate but you just don't like the material and it's Absolutely. not there yet and you yeah. just have to politely be like you know I'm going to check out a few more shows we'll see how it goes and it's, and you feel terrible anytime telling someone their art like it's not there for you yeah you're not even saying like you suck you're just right. like I, you know uh, I'm not there really, yet it's not working for me but you know I've always felt honesty's better right I was just going to say you support people so well like it I, doesn't matter though if you tell someone that you're not in a position to support them or like I guess you know, yeah. like what I usually that, that, that what does always feel bad. Yeah, because yeah. what I usually say, I mean, the show's called "I'm a fan of." Yeah, I have to be a fan. You of have it. to be a fan. I of have it. to like it. Yeah, there's no favors. There's no right. I enjoy it or I don't. Which is one of the reasons listening to your podcast isn't an awful experience. I, I'd because like to think so. Like I the hope. number <laughs> of times you listen to like these big mainstream podcasts yeah. where it's like you are the funniest guy. Listen. Of all the guys, you make me laugh harder than anyone I've ever right. seen. And it's like, we've had five you episodes say of you saying next, this yeah. to every yeah. guy. Yeah. And I'm beginning to think that we're not really being sincere <laughs> on this thing. You're just, it's all a, a money grab. And it's like, here's a big name. I can't fucking stand this guy. Listen, yeah. let's just make it work. I know. And it's I never want to say anything negative. Sure. I only want to yeah. say something positive. Yeah. So my whole thing is, you know, uh, like I've started doing the music reviews, which I really enjoy doing. I, yeah. And it's like, I don't want to do reviews that are like, for me, this was terrible. I don't know why they put this out. 100% pass on this. Mm. I would never do that, right? Right. But at the same time, you know, you still have to tell people, like, this thing didn't really the, work for me. The reason much. I'm not going to say anything nice about it is because I just don't like it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> well, so that's actually been a really beautiful thing. There's a There are two guys I watch um, on YouTube for, like, m- movie, their movie reviews and stuff. Mm-hmm. One of them's named Chris Stuckman, and... Uh, he does great stuff, but recently, I'd say within the past year, he made a video where he was like, I am going to make a change on my channel. I'm not going to review or talk about movies that don't excite me. Mm-hmm. If it doesn't excite me, I'm just not going to talk about it because I don't want to contribute to the negativity yeah. that sometimes he was like, some, I realized that some of my most viewed videos are ones where I'm just tearing apart a movie mm-hmm. and I don't want to be adding to that kind of energy on the internet. Like this is going to be a very negative, horrible place. And any movie that comes out, it is an incredible amount of work that went in to make that become a reality that could then be shown mm-hmm. on screens across the world. 100%. Like, abs- that's a huge thing that happened. So I'm, I'm just not going to contribute to sharing negative views on things that I just don't really care yeah. about it. And, and every- if I do care about it, I'm just going to tell you what I think. And yeah. everyone who was working on that movie was trying to make it a great movie. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And there's so... And- I don't understand how movies can can get made. Period. Because it's like insanity. when you think about making a record, oh my god, the amount of things that could go wrong uh-huh. that can't line up. Yeah. So yeah, I mean it's the same way with music with comedy. It's like I know when someone writes 
a trash comedy bit mm-hmm. that they wanted it to be good. Yeah, you know they were really hoping. I if if they're if there's someone who I've seen consistently at open mics or shows, it's like I know they're trying to be good. It's just not there. Yeah, and you hope they turn the corner, but sometimes they don't. And yeah. you know. Same way with music. It's like, man, the shittiest songs. They <laughs> a tried, bad song's a bad song. <laughs> they tried really hard to make that song not shitty, you know? So I don't want to sit here and be like, you fucking suck, man. Uh, I'll do a review, but it's going to be like me telling people you suck, okay? You you asked for it. Don't reach out to me uh, if you don't, All right, you don't cool, want it. All right, cool. I'll see you around. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Anyway, whatever. Like, subscribe, you know. <laughs> No, that guy's totally right though. It's so easy. It's so easy to shit on stuff. Sorry, I just love the idea of someone being like, "Hey, I just wanted to submit my new record. I worked really hard on it. All right, I will talk about it, but it fucking sucks." But I mean, <laughs> if you just want me to tell you how bad it sucks, I guess I will. Um, yeah, it's, it's. But that guy's totally right. I could I could make a podcast that analytically destroyed everything mm-hmm. right or even even on a record i love i could be like you know i love this record but this 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 and we're shit yeah and i think they should have done this this and this sure and um you know that's the old um journalism thing right yeah. if it bleeds it reads right and you that's gotta such find things that you, you yeah. can tear apart so people really like, yeah. oh, the, the positivity is always the harder sell yeah but i you know i just i've always the only advice i've ever given people for artistic endeavors is to just you know, make sure you're one hundred percent happy with it because you can't control who likes it. Yeah. And if it if you're a hundred percent happy with it and nobody ever vibes with it and everyone thinks you're terrible, At least you still you love it. And that's yeah. you know, but if you go change everything to right. try to get And even you don't like it, yeah, and then no one likes it, it's like what are it's you like, doing? Then you just you fucking suck now. Yeah. <laughs> now it really sucks, right? Now you tried to sell out, it didn't work, it's fucking horrible. Just be yourself and have no one like you. At least then you can like yourself, you know? Um, so uh, that, that's that's why it's like, I don't want to shit on stuff. Yeah. I mean, one of the written reviews I did, uh, there was one track where I didn't even say I didn't like it. I was just like, I don't think it belongs on this album. And I, I right. remember texting you like, am I being a dick? Is this too too hard, you know, <laughs> too harsh? Because it's like, you know, I don't want that person to read it and go, Oh, they'll they'll read all the nice stuff and go. Oh, but they thought this song sucked, huh? Yeah. All right, I hate them. And like, no. and the thing is too, like, um, there were a bunch of songs for this record that didn't make it on, mm-hmm. and um, it. I think that's also kind of that's good. It feels like um, a move towards maturity for me because in the past it'd be like, oh, I recorded it, goes on the record. Like, mm. No. That that's not that doesn't make any sense actually. You're gonna record a bunch of really bad things. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, making sure that whatever it is that you are making, and I don't make singles. I make albums. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, is this serving the album? You know, and if it doesn't serve the album, it can go somewhere else. Maybe it goes on a future project. Now I have songs that are two, three years old that have not been released yet. Yeah. And I've started performing them now, which means yeah, that, I love that they're probably going to appear. But I love like, that clip you had where it was like, a, I don't know if it's smart to promote a song that's going on the seventh album before you've released the sixth yeah. album. <laughs> 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 but I mean, look at pseudo anonymity, right? That yeah. you wrote that song when you were 14 yeah. and it took this long to put it on a record. Right. So you never know when one of these other ones going to come yeah. back around and be like, oh, it, now it's a perfect It's fit. just better to be yeah. open to it. I'm so glad uh, you're one of the people who likes to focus on a theme, an album, mm-hmm. a complete, you know, this is this. Right. And then we will put this behind us now. Yeah. Because I think that's how most music should be made. Yeah. I love the idea of just getting a, a you know, a, just a theme. Just this is the, I'm trying to think how to, even, on this album specifically, I had to listen to a few songs like I would switch back and forth to them. Really? Because for a moment I thought you might have intentionally been scoring this album. You know how when you watch old movies and they change just enough of one song that it's another song? Uh-huh. I was like, is he scoring the record where we're recycling a lot of pieces on purpose? And then I was listening, I was like, I don't think he's doing that. No. I think the theme of the album is just doing it's that to just my mind. So yeah, it's so um I guess I hope it's coherent, but it's so cohesive, Mm -hmm. I think, in terms of... At least I wanted it to be. Um, I don't know if I was successful in that. But I think, based on what you're saying, I was. Because it's like you're... um, 
Because I genuinely thought some of the riffs were so similar that I was like, did he, you know, because even on something like Family Guy, right? Mm -hmm. That it'll be just the same, just similar enough, but it's different. And then I was listening. I was like, no, 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 those, those riffs aren't the same. I'm, I'm connecting dots that aren't here. But Um, there, there are, there are a lot of similarities, even just in terms of, um, harmonic choices Mm -hmm. where, um, uh, and, and those things are motifs in a sense that are that are working their way. Th- like if you think of the album as like a symphony with multiple movements as opposed to a collection of songs that maybe are connected to each other. Mm-hmm. Like the order of the record, how it flows, which things I'm showing you where and how those things call back to this and then we're all moving around. Like it, it really works like that. Mm-hmm. And so sometimes you do hear things that are meant to be allusions to earlier things mm-hmm. because it's like, oh, we're, we're referencing this now. And so do you perform that way live? No. Hmm. No. Stuff is, um, especially because I play so many so far shows. Mm-hmm. I mean, one of my opening bits is like, I'm always so excited when I've booked another so far show because it allows me to continue in, under the delusion that I have a career. And then after that, I just post a show high, you know, pick, pick, yeah, book to show high, is uh, the the realization that I now have to go and decide what to play for you. And I have about 25 minutes to convince you that my music is good, <laughs> worth listening to, and perhaps you should give me money. <laughs> and so I run to all of my music, and I look at my discography, and it dawns on me that I've never written a good song. so the only thing you can do is be relatable and so uh, typically i try to to build um, my set list around you know new material but also trying to be relatable in that moment Mm -hmm. because that's what i'm there to do i'm there to relate to the audience to to show them my art in a in a way that makes it accessible to them but also dude all i really want is for my audience members to start crying that's really Mm -hmm. all i want and a lot of the times it works, you know, that's what I want. Like I want people laughing and then crying and then laughing again the I, whole time I'm on stage. You're, you're not alone in, in that type of performance environment, people wanting that. I think the, the more I dive into this, I think there needs to be a new type of venue mm. because uh, I had a guy on here, his, his band, him and his band, it's called fish, uh, fish boy. And, um, a lot of his songs are extremely narrative. Mm. And he's more kind of goofy and silly. Like Ween or something? Kind of. I'll, I'll have to send it to you. But, like, he wrote an entire album um, called Art Guards. Okay. And, like, one of the songs is... Like, the whole album was written about people in their careers. Okay. So, like, this song is, I'm an art guard. like, And he's singing about, like... You know, I'm at the thing, I guard this, somebody's walking by doing that. But And it's very, like, upbeat, it's up-tempo. Yeah. And it's not, like, silly. It's not okay. stupid. Right. He's trying to... To it, capture, yeah, like, the feeling around it. it's very something. interesting. Yeah. And a lot of his music is that way where he's like, I kind of want to do a multi- multimedia show where I can tell a story or express a full thought that's, and then play a that's song. That's what I'm doing. Right. Yeah. And then... Um, a couple of years ago, I was able to host this show at this cabin called Big Thicket for yeah. Brave Little Howl. Yeah. And uh, did I ever mail you that record? You never did, but I don't, have a, rec- I don't have a record player. Oh, that's right. That's yeah. right. Uh, you kept saying you were going to, and I was like, dude, don't waste this record on me. I'll probably just send you a record player, too, then. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow. I won't be upset about what that. What was very fun about that night was it's like the So Far setting where there's a little bit of storytelling behind yeah. the song. And then you go, oh, Okay. I can All see right. what this um, is. Because songs can be so vague and nebulous, yeah. right? And um, it's really nice. Like, you really capture what that artist is about, and then you connect with that song, you know, on a deeper level. So, I, th- it feels like there needs to be a new type of venue that's geared around that type of performance. Yeah. Because the only places that are doing it now are things like So Far, where it's kind of like a pop up. Yeah. But imagine if you had places that had, you they know, they were known for that, had screens set up and yeah. you, could, you could put, you know, whatever Images videos or, you yeah, want. Yeah. And like you could turn it into, you know, it's a mixture of a one man show and a concert. Yeah. You know, I that think would that be would be incredible. really, really fun. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, hopefully, you, you need the to get future, that going. <laughs> yeah. Allows for things like that. Yeah. To, I mean, because you could go through each one of your albums that way. Yeah. I you really know? could. I mean, you could, it would be very fun. Yeah. But uh, uh, before I forget, you were telling the story of the album title at yeah. one of these shows. Would you go through that, please? Because yeah. I found that to be so... Because I do look at the titles of a lot of your albums and go, 
<laughs> where are we at here? What am I supposed to, you know, because do I want to think I'm getting it? Is it something else? <laughs> Is it on the nose and I'm just overthinking it? You know, but anyway, please explain. First of all, yeah. remind us what the title is. Yeah, the title of the record is Awful, Pompous, and Artificial. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it is a reference to an apocryphal story. Um, and uh, basically, it's like one of four or five different monarchs in England in a certain period, 200, 300 years ago, are asked what they think. What's their opinion of St. Paul's Cathedral? Because it's just been finished and it's this huge, ornate building. And uh, it took a long time to build. And uh, the king replies, oh, yes, quite. It's awful, pompous, and artificial, isn't it? And um, in those days, all three of those words had positive connotations. Like an awful thing was a thing full of awe. An artificial thing was a Mm. work of artifice. A, a pompous thing was pomp and circumstance and all these things. Like it's just it's good, it's big, and it it does exactly what it's supposed to do really well. Yeah. Hey, you fast forward to the to modern period, and all three of those words of negative connotations. Yeah. Like we <laughs> call anything that, and we're like, no, this piece of shit. Please, yeah. Please get it away from me. <laughs> so um, the way that the title works is like, uh, I mean, I always say I just wanted to beat the critics to it, you know, but. Um, <laughs> It's it's more than that. I there I want it. It has like I can't even remember how all the levels work, but it's just like three or yeah. four meta meta levels yeah. where it's like this is the joke and how it's working with it within itself. You know, that's so much fun. Yeah. So it's really like the more time and thought that the the listener or audience puts into it, the more they get out of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I love it, man. Um, listen, I know you're in town visiting family and everybody. I appreciate you taking the time to come see me because yeah, I know they're probably everybody's stretching you thin now yeah. that you're coming back and visiting the Texas. It was nice that you uh, you reached out about it because it was like uh, I, now I could protect a day. Oh, where it was okay. like, no, nope, no, nope, we're not doing anything. I got this. I have down. to talk to Travis tonight. I'm not doing <laughs> anything else. So it was like not, today was nice. Well, yeah. I I do appreciate it, man, and uh, I love the new album. Thank and you. And I know you're gonna have another one out next year, probably, <laughs> right? And then the year after that. So, um, is there um, what what's the place you love people to go to? Are you big? I love using Instagram to, mostly. Or? Well, Instagram's nice. If you're gonna listen to music and you want to support what we're doing, buy it on Bandcamp, mm-hmm. please. You know. Um, it, it helps a lot. A lot of people have bought it, which is nice, but yeah. just go do that. And I believe uh, Bandcamp still does the Artist Fridays, right? They do, yeah. Where if you purchase something on a Friday... Yeah, the first the, Friday of every month. The bands get... Is it 100%, 100% of the yeah, profit? Bandcamp doesn't take any, yeah, which is really cool. If anybody out there works at Bandcamp, okay? I'm just... When we talked about me wishing I could give people feedback, yeah. and they take it constructively, right? the only thing that holds Bandcamp back mm. is they need a slick listening app yeah if they well they do have one but it's just not as good it's clunky it's not as good yeah if they can find a way to design something that is as intuitive as spotify Spotify, yeah that where you're just going through songs but then it allows you to go to the band's page and purchase or do whatever that would be that's the only thing they're missing because they're the way they run their business is incredible it's so much better people that like have a massive computer setup and monitors and speakers and things like this and Mm -hmm. they listen to music at their computer Mm -hmm. Bandcamp is great. Yeah. It's For amazing. the rest of us though, who probably aren't doing that, it's like, what the heck is this? Yeah. Like I don't I don't even know how to download this yeah. thing. Yeah. And their want. their mission is so much more virtuous than the yeah. other big streaming platforms. <laughs> right. And so know? it's just gonna be more difficult. Yeah. And so but it's like, please, if anyone there is listening who works there, invest it's worth the investment. You have, yeah, yeah. Like you're probably gonna cringe, but it's like be like Spotify, just stay being like Bandcamp. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but uh yeah. And have you found a way to put any of this on vinyl yet? So that is the hope with this one. I was going to do This one it. would be a great vinyl this record. This would be a great one. Mm-hmm. Um, the thing is, it's so long, it has to be a double. Yeah, and now and that's expensive. And that is really expensive. Yeah. But I'm hoping to do it. Um, mm-hmm. If not this year, I think I can do it this year. But it will just take a minute to get that funding. Have you considered... Um, are there any labels you would ever want to team up with just there, in hopes of getting a vinyl? Sure. Yeah, there are labels, but I talked to, to a lot of people specifically before I released this record because mm-hmm. I was willing, I was thinking about shopping it around and submitting it to labels. But the amount of people I talked to who had had that experience and then other experiences, it was like, I don't want any of that. Fair I enough. will yeah. always want the rights to my music, mm-hmm. and labels are never going to, at my stature, they're not going to give you that. Yeah. That's, That's just true. not going to happen. So for me, it's like, well, then I don't need... What are they going to do for me? Mm-hmm. They're going to take my music from me. 
I won't own it anymore forever across the known universe in perpetuity for as long as Bush shall live. Um, and then they, if it doesn't sell well, they're just like, well, we're not going to make vinyl of this. Nobody's going to buy yeah. it. So now we own your stuff and you can't do anything with it. Goodbye. Mm-hmm. Like, no. I'm a fan of DIY, but I yeah. also, I just. You, you know, understand how expensive it is. Though. Yeah, yeah. A double, a double LP is thousands and thousands of dollars. And the thing is, like, if we just took pseudo anonymity off the record i could put it on a single yeah but don't do that but don't do that <laughs> right because that, do that that isn't what the record is no, you no, know no. and you know again it's the type of record i mean it's the type of album you want to be able to drop a needle and let it go yeah and that's it you right. know and uh, well you have to stop and put another one on but yeah well the the brave little howl record i did is a double lp oh really yeah and so well, it's then like we need to talk about how you did that yeah and okay. it's like a i love it because it's a it's a gatefold you know you open yeah. it and um you know, you there's having that much real estate, you can Do put it. things in there yeah. that let people have a tangible connection to it. So right. I was able to write a little piece about the experience, nice. and then we got a beautiful picture. And I was able to. Did you have the piece that you wrote edited by that guy that made? No, your stuff? it was just me. Oh, yeah, awesome. The way I wanted to do it, <laughs> and then um, I even was able to be, you know. I was able to do it the way I wanted to that the band approved of. Nice. Um, so like I was able to put like instructions on how I think you should listen to this okay, record, yeah, like cool. the environment you should right. be in. And um, the thing that I did on it that I was kind of iffy about is uh, I didn't cut any grooves for song selection. Okay. So there's no way to skip songs. Right. I mean, you can guess. But right, but it's not going <laughs> to... And um, I was like, oof. I wonder if I'm going to get any negative feedback on it. Did you? Nope. Everybody loved it. Yeah. Everyone was like, this is an experience. You start it and you finish it. Yeah. And I was like, all right, that's all I and wanted. I think from for the kind of stuff that I'm making, mm-hmm. that is the best medium for my stuff to be listened to. Yeah. Because that's how it's supposed to be listened to. Yeah. And it's so easy on Spotify or anywhere else to be like, yeah, there's that song. I got to go do something else. And it's like, well, yeah, you're not intentionally listening to music. Really, I don't intentionally listen to music typically when I'm yeah. listening to music on my phone. But when I sit down in front of something, it's like, no, I'm sitting here and listening to this. When I found that I got the most out of your record, I don't know if it's any help or not for, yeah. for you or for I'd, listeners. Yeah, I want to know. But, you know, they're uh, like, you were kind enough to send me advanced streaming yeah. stuff, mm-hmm. but I almost liked that less because it doesn't flow the way you want it to. Sure. Right? You're selecting stuff. So uh, when it did come out and I could stream it, um, I was able to give it, you know, the full front to back listen, which is my preferred way. Mm -hmm. And then I was able to skip around a little while, full front to back listen. So I think I gave it three full uninterrupted listens at different times. Wow. Because I like to soak and come back. Yeah, 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 I get it. And it dawned on me um, today when I was re-listening to it just to kind of get caught back up again. uh, I was listening to it today solely in headphones. Mm. And so you got to hear a lot of the detail on the album. That when you're driving in a car, yeah, you know the, the hum of the road noise, the, that the you miss, yeah. And so, uh, yeah, if if it's somebody who hasn't listened to the album yet, and you're going to commit to listening to it the way we talked about it, I would recommend block out some time and put on some headphones and sit down somewhere, or like pick a task. You know, if you're walking the dog and you want to go for an hour long walk, yeah, you know, put the headphones in. Something about that was really cool, okay, and it's still awesome. good in the car. But you know what I mean? There's yeah. always just the minutiae gets drowned no, it out does, of yeah. any record. Absolutely. And uh, and that it is meant to be listened to though. Yeah. Way. Yeah. So I, I'm anyway. so glad that we could do this again. <laughs> it's so nice to see <laughs> you too, again. Yeah. And, uh, Anytime you're back in town, you can yeah. come on. I don't All care. Right. Yeah. Awesome. If, even if you just want to talk about like, so I've uh, been married for a while now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That'd be fun. Yeah. Um, anything else you want to say before we get you out of here, man? Um, no, I don't think so. Look, right. Find our awful pompous and artificial everywhere, wherever mm-hmm. you listen to music and, uh, Reach out on Instagram. I love. I've had a number of people this week and last week reach out, and they're just like, "I listened to the the album. This is what I thought about it." And that that kind of stuff is so encouraging, and it it means so much, and it feels so incredible. Mm-hmm. Um, so it. I've had some people be like, "Ah, oh, I was going to reach out, but I got scared." I'm like, don't be scared. Yeah, please reach out. It means yeah. a lot. Just yeah. send the message. Just yeah. do it. Please do. All right. Well, thanks again, man. Look All forward right. to having you back on here soon. Yeah, me too. The I'm a Fan of podcast, music, comedy, and more.